Good members, um, good morning. You're very welcome to the committee. I um, advise you that throughout the meeting to maintain social distancing. Um, today we will consider subordinate legislation and the joint briefing from DFI Active Travel Unit and Sustrans in relation to active travel. And we also have a departmental briefing with regards to living with water in Belfast. Apologies, I received one apology from Keith Buchanan. We have two members who are joining the meeting via Starley. So we have um, Dolores Kelly and Liz Kimmons. You're both welcome to the meeting. Um, just wish to um, then move on to chairperson's business. I'm just advised that the committee has received a briefing on the 23rd of September from the Minister on accelerated passage of the Harbours Bill. And this sets out the, um, the issue about raising and the existing limit of £35 million pounds that the department can provide um, by means of loans and grants to the ports. Um, the committee was content with the bill, but did not formally agree. So for the public record, are you content with the accelerated passage? Right. Obviously, right. it's not been tabled, actually, in yeah. our papers, I think maybe the start of December. Um, so if members agree, then we will write to the, the speaker to inform him of our decision. So if you're happy enough with that. Moving then to draft minutes at page six, and therefore the meeting of the 11th of November, if members are content. <coughs> Matters arising are at page 12, again from the meeting of the 11th of November. Members have any issues from that meeting? Um, at page 15, we have a, a list of outstanding requests um, for um, information. Again, is there any issues there that are drawing members' eyes, no, to them, no, content. Moving then to correspondence, uh, just draw your attention to correspondence memo at page 23 and tabled at page 3. So page 24, we have a copy of the Committee for the Economy's Correspondence to the Minister for <coughs> Infrastructure in relation to airport connectivity. Um, obviously, there's been quite a, a discussion in relation to airports over the last um, week or so, particularly in relation to decisions in, in Belfast International Airport, and obviously the need perhaps for assistance to the airports. Members are content that we we write to to the minister yep. in yes. in relation to that. I think that's this actually become quite very critical for us, Agreed. Mr. Muir. Yeah, I agree with you, Chair. I think it's important we write to the infrastructure minister to see what support the executive can provide to your airports. Obviously. In conjunction with the Department of Transport in London as well, but it's, it's you know, a key issue. And it's the fact that the, the main airport in Northern Ireland is now part time is a real concern. Mm, and the impact of well, this, this is quite broad implications, just even for commercial and everything else, or, um, as well. So and freight. So I mean, it's it's it's, it's quite far reaching, Miss Anderson. If we could ensure it's all the airports, some kind yes. of the well, obviously of Dublin and Derry and even and and, um, and uh, Belfast as well, so. I keep referring back to it as the harbour. That's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> George Best. Um, any other comments in relation to that? No. Okay. Um, at page 33. That's the local stuff done with that, right? Sorry. That's the local stuff dealt with. <laughs> um, at page 33, we've um, system operator for Northern Ireland, a Sony correspondence providing a copy of the consultation on the transmission development plan for Northern Ireland 2020 to 29. And a request to to brief the committee members' comments in relation to that. No, I also had a I, I, I had a conversation with NIE actually in the last week, and they would be keen to to meet with the committee as well. So it may be something that we wish to to um, include as well. Mm -hmm. So members are content that we do that too. Um, page 46, we have correspondence from uh, Ms. McDowell regarding the resumption of driving tests following the extension of. COVID um, restrictions. If you're content, um, we'll forward this comment and advise to the department and advise Ms. McDowell that she should uh, obviously correspond with the department on this matter. Um, she did um, contact me and I spoke to her, um, and coincidentally, she's in my constituency, um, and I have forwarded that to the minister. I, I did have a, an unusual issue with whenever I sent this through it just before lunchtime on Friday that the minister's email um, box was closed. So I'm not sure whether that's normal practice or not. That, um, that I have discovered that on a Friday afternoon as well. That was it, just before lunchtime on Friday. That mm. the, so I that might be something that we may wish to, to raise as well. Yeah, yeah, we it should. seems highly unusual, but um, I don't know whether this is practice. Maybe an auto rule or something. Because I have found I've wrote to a few ministers and I've been able to contact them on a Friday afternoon, but I know the Minister for Infrastructure 
um, I have had a reply back to say that the, the inbox is closed and to contact on Monday, which yeah. really isn't a, a good Not position for us to be in. It's just um, so if we maybe just want to, to raise that just as a query in relation to that too. Um, tabled at page four is the ministerial response regarding committee concerns regarding the transport regulations unit. Members, any comment in relation to that at this stage? That may be something that we want to come back to again. Mm, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then tabled at page 11, we have the interim report from the examiner of statutory rules, Angela Kelly, highlighting two SRs. It's SR 2020-218, which is the Planning Act 2011 Review Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and SR 2020-222, which is amendments to the carriage of dangerous goods and use of transportable pressure equipment regulation, Northern Ireland 2010. Um, obviously, we had agreed those statutory rules, but obviously subject to examiner's report. The examiner <coughs> has advised that she won't um, draw special attention um, of the Assembly to SR 2020 222 in the report. That's the carriage of dangerous goods and use of transportable pressure equipment. However, um, she has now advised that she will draw special attention to this of the Assembly to SR 2020-218, um, which is the Planning Act 2011 Review Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, on the grounds that it makes an unusual or unexpected use of the power conferred by the parent legislation. If members are content that we perhaps write to the Minister, um, uh, recommending that we wish to take on board the comments um, and the recommendations of the examiner um, and uh, perhaps um, ask her to, to look for a solution to that. Mm. Members are content that we do that. Okay. So um, actions are obviously suggested in the correspondence memo, so if you're content with that. Agreed. Okay. Moving then to item number six, which is supporting the legislation SL1's not subject to assembly proceedings. So we have SL1, the parking and waiting restrictions, Donnock Moore Order, Northern Ireland 2020. SL1, the parking and waiting restrictions, London Dairy Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. SL1, the parking places on roads, coaches, Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. SL1, the waiting restrictions, Lisburn Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. And the parking places on roads and waiting restrictions, Cookstown Order, Northern Ireland 2020. There are five proposals setting new parking and waiting restrictions, obviously that's across a range of areas in Northern Ireland. In the SL1s, the Department has set out the details of the new parking and waiting times and the reasons for the changes. The Department has carried out consultations for each and outlined how it has responded to any objections received. Uh, the SL1, the waiting restrictions, Lisburn Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, not all the objections were withdrawn. Um, and tabled at page 14 is a clerk's memo on information received from the department um, just with regards to the objection. The SL1s are at pages 48, 50, 52, 55 and 57. These proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings. Do members have any comment or concerns in relation to that? Or are you content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Content. Content. Okay, thank you. Moving then to item 7, which is SR 2020-249, the Taxi Driver Coronavirus Financial Assistance Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. And you'll find that at page 60. So the committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 4th of November and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. <coughs> Are members content with this rule or have you any other comments to make in relation to this? Ms Anderson. Um, I'm content with the rule. I raised an issue last week in relation to the insurance. I further want to raise another issue that I'm sure other uh, MLAs have been receiving information from, um, from taxi drivers, and it's around the need to protect their benefits. 
Some are telling me they don't want, for instance, to apply to the scheme in one hand and then it be taken off them in another for housing benefits or so <coughs> on and so forth. So I would ask if the minister as the lead minister could engage with the, uh, the Minister for Communities and try and get this matter resolved. Are members content that perhaps we also write then to the, the Committee for Communities just in relation to that, just to say that we have raised this as a concern so at least it's on their radar as well? Yeah, and I would just ask that it doesn't ping pong as we've had enough of that. I think of it from from uh, this issue with with departments before. So, if the lead minister could talk to the other uh, minister responsible for this, and just let's see if we can get a resolution for these taxi drivers. Anyone else? Any comments? No, I okay. agree with that, Chair. Yeah. Okay, content with the rule. Agreed. Okay, so the, the committee for infrastructure has considered SR twenty twenty. 249, the Taxi Driver Coronavirus Financial Assistance Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Okay, we're moving then to item 8, which is a joint briefing uh, with the Department for Infrastructure and Sustrans Active Travel. At page 72, you have Sustrans briefing paper, Active Travel Essential for a Green Recovery. At page 88, with Sustrans Safe Routes to School. At page 90, we have Sustrans Active on the School Run. And tabled at page 17, we have uh, a briefing paper on walking and cycling. Advise that um, the committee staff have emailed members a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, which has been provided by Sustrans that could not be provided and included in the pack. So also to advise everyone that Hansard will record the meeting. So after that, can I welcome um, Caroline Bloomfield, Director of um, Sustrans. We have Anne Madden, Policy and Media Advisor with Sustrans. Liz Loughran, the Director of uh, Transport Policy, um, the Department for Infrastructure, and Claire Mulvena, Active Travel Branch, Department for Infrastructure. All very welcome to committee Thank today. You. So it's really good to see you. Um, if you'd like to start off with a um, opening statement, and members will follow up with some questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'll open up for the department. Um, just, um, I mean, the minister has indicated on a number of occasions that she is very keen to um, change the way that we live. Very keen to improve walking and cycling infrastructure for health reasons, um, particularly mental health reasons, um, and um, inter, um, air quality reasons. Um, the, obviously, during the pandemic, we've seen a big change in the way that um, people, a lot of people seem to have rediscovered walking and cycling. Um, the minister had then, this had led the minister, she'd already been talking about a green recovery and was very focused on um, dealing with the climate crisis, but she, um, the current crisis has given, she's asked the department to accelerate a number of issues to make sure that as we emerge from this, we take a green approach to it. Um, we've made um, a progress on a number of fronts. Um, she created the position of walking and cycling champion um, in May, um, and I am the walking and cycling champion for the department. Um, the reason it sits with me and the reason it sits within transport policy is really to make sure that everything we do in terms of transport policy refers to walking and cycling, and walking and cycling is thought about when we make any other form of transport policy. So it's about embedding the needs of um, people who walk and people who cycle within um, general transport policy, but also within the transport plans that we're developing at the moment and making sure that it is at the heart of the department. Um, to help me in that role, um, we, um, the minister established a walking and cycling advisory group. So the role of that group is to discuss areas of interest, um, but also to offer advice to me and to challenge me um, as we move forward on walking and cycling. Um, 
the minister then also created a blue-green infrastructure fund. So that is £20 million of capital, um, which is intended to both promote active travel and help to reshape places um, and transform communities. So some of that so far has been allocated to um, greenway projects, to pilots, to um, part to um, in partnership with DFC to the um, COVID revitalisation fund. Um, we're also using some of it to do work on um, footpath um, and cycle paths um, with our roads colleagues. Um, and there are a number of other initiatives that I'm working on at the moment that um, the minister will um, advise the committee of in due course. Um, we have um, also, um, written to councils um, asking them to bring forward ideas. Um, we've had quite intensive engagement with a number of councils, um, talking to them about things that might help and things that they want to try and things that they want to do. It, it, it's a really fruitful approach in terms of the partnerships that we're building there and the work that the councils um, are doing with their stakeholders. Um, but it's it's quite an intensive process. Um, but the things that are coming out of it already, um, I think it's a very worthwhile process. Um, the um, minister has also um, looked at some of our work with schools, which I know that Caroline's going to talk about later. We have a partnership with um, Sustrans in terms of the Active Schools Travel Programme. Um, there are also um, a range of road safety teaching resources that we provide, and the Minister has also um, is also rolling out 120 mile an hour safe zones at schools, um, intending to making sure that children can walk to school, can be safer, um, complementing our efforts really to make sure that they feel confident to walk, wheel, cycle, scoot. Um, we also, um, earlier in the year, um, put out a Great Things Happen campaign, um, an advertising campaign to encourage people to walk for shorter journeys wherever possible. Um, about a third of all journeys in Northern Ireland are less than two miles. Um, so there is clearly a real untapped um, resource there for walking. Um, another third are less than, are between two and five miles. So again, cycling comes to the fore there. Um, Again, this is about trying to capitalise on well-being benefits, uh, mental health improvement, physical exercise, but also about tackling childhood ob obesity and addressing the detrimental effects that current traffic patterns have both on air quality, but also on our places as they become car dominated. Um, and as final, the, just the final point from me um, around the Belfast Bicycle Network, um, a much delayed um, piece of work. Um, we originally started developing the network in 2015. We consulted in 2017. Um, in the absence of ministers, work was paused, but we have um, we are putting together the final version of the Belfast Bicycle Network at the moment. Um, hopefully that will be the first of many. There is the work on transport plans has shown us and the analysis for the transport plans has shown us that for a number of the market towns there are really significant um, cycling opportunities and cycling network opportunities. So I very much hope that the Belfast one is the first of many. Um, and those are my opening comments, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, well, look, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to speak to you this morning. Uh, and I'd just like to take you through some of the slides that, uh, that we sent through uh, in advance. I'd like to talk a little bit about why we believe active travel is so vital, both today but also as part of our green recovery. And I want to say just a little bit about some of the things that we think are important if we really want to see change here. 
So for those who don't know, Sustrans is a UK-wide organisation, been in existence for about 40 years, though I just joined four months ago from Public Health Agency, so I'm relatively new. But Sustrans' vision really resonates with me, and that's that the way we choose to travel creates healthier places and happier lives for everyone. Uh, and we really want to make it easier for people to walk and cycle. And we have two key priorities. Paths for everyone, so that greenways and safe routes that a sensible 12-year-old could use on their own. And then livable cities and towns for everyone, so people are supported and enabled to walk or cycle for everyday journeys. And we really want to see a shift away from a focus on moving cars to a focus on moving people in and through our, our towns and cities. And so why is any of this important? I think Liz has already alluded to some of them, but we know it's very good for physical health, being physically active, being physically active dramatically reduces a person's risk of a number of serious health conditions such as heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes and so on. We also know it reduces uh, anxiety and depression, promotes well-being, it reduces congestion and importantly air pollution and noise pollution. We certainly noticed that during lockdown and it can bring economic benefits as well and real tourist potential uh, around gr greenways in particular. But we know that walking inside, we know that making it easier for everyone is really important because there are underrepresented groups. The Belfast Bike Life report that was published earlier this year showed that in Belfast, 19% of men cycle once a week or more, only 5% of women do. And the reasons cited were safety and poor weather. Now, we can't do much about the weather, and I agree it was challenging cycling this morning, <laughs> but we absolutely can and should do something about the safety issue and the infrastructure. Because when I cycle on local greenways, I see all ages and abilities. I see small children, children cycling to school. I see older people walking dogs. But when I cycle on roads, I see few women and even fewer children. And I think if we want to be inclusive, we really need to see much greater focus on providing safe, dedicated infrastructure. And Currently, across the UK and in Ireland, there is a vast array of, of di differential in, in spending. Uh, you know, I think it's estimated at the moment in England at seven pounds per head, rising to ten pounds per head in Wales, twenty-five in Scotland, and a massive sixty-six pounds per head in the Republic of Ireland has been announced. Whereas in Northern Ireland, traditionally, it's been about two pounds per head. So it's much, it has been much lower here. With the gear change plan in, in England, which is a very ambitious programme for England, the Republic of Ireland has committed to investing 20% of its entire transport budget. Uh, so you can see with this massive differential, there's, you know, there's a possibility that Northern Ireland gets left behind in this green recovery. Now, there is positive news. 20 million has been awarded this year for blue-green infrastructure. That's really, really welcome. Uh, but that's a small percentage of the overall transport budget. And what I think we need to see is a long-term strategic approach to funding active travel so that we can really build on this. And I appreciate funding isn't finite, but we do have money, and I think we need to reprioritise how we spend the money that we have. And there is a strong economic case. The Department for Transport in England reckons that for every £1 spent, there's £5.50 of economic benefits back, which is much higher than road and rail schemes. Uh, and when COVID-19 hit, it became more obvious than ever how much uh, space we devote to cars. I think there's a slide, uh, uh, pictures on page slide seven, which show that. And there was much greater recognition that we need more space for socially distanced walking and cycling. And at that time, it was really great to see the rapid progress that the, the department made in pop-up infrastructure. We saw that on the Dublin Road and Grosvenor Road in Belfast at the quay in Londonderry, some pedestrianisation in the cathedral quarter. And that was all really, really positive, and it happened really fast. And it also showed what could happen when the political will was there. They went up in a matter of weeks, and I know some of the ones in Belfast have taken years to, to, to construct. However, things have slowed dramatically since then, and I'm not here to criticise Liz and her colleagues, because I know they're doing really good work, but, uh, and, and I think are under-resourced to do it. Uh, but I, I would like to see the department shaken up a bit with more alignments between divisions, especially with road service being more integrated around active travel. Uh, and really just to, to help close that gap between the minister's stated vision and ambition around active travel and what is actually being delivered now. 
Uh, and uh, well, there's a slide there just showing our Space to Move app, where, we, where we've put in all the different programmes that have happened around the UK in terms of pop-up. And you can see that a lot has happened around the UK. And ours, although we started well, has been relatively small. So if there's four key things that we believe could make a significant difference in, a, in, a, in boosting active travel levels. And the first is safe routes to school. And Liz has mentioned this briefly, but we believe that every child has the right to a safe and sustainable journey to school. 50% of primary school children in Northern Ireland live under a mile from school, yet two thirds of primary school children are driven to school. I mean, that's a shocking statistic for me. Uh, we have an active travel school programme, which has been really successful where we work with schools to support and enable more children to walk and cycle to school, but we know it could have so much more impact if it was married with a programme of infrastructure improvements. And as part of that, we'd like to see school streets piloted here. Uh, that's where a street is closed to through traffic at, at, at start and finish times in school. And there's a number of pilots happening in GB, and they seem to be very successful and popular. Um, so, I mean, how safe are our routes to school? Uh, I have a, a slide here. Uh, we, we, do a, we do a basic audit of all the schools we work in every year. And uh, of the 30 schools who just joined, it's normally 60 a year, but there's fewer this year because of COVID. So of the, th of the 30 schools, none had 20 mile an hour limits outside. A third of them had 50 or 60 mile an hour speed limits outside the gates. 17% of schools had no footpaths. 93% of schools had no traffic calming. Uh, another 93 had no cycle paths and 83% had no ro road crossing within walking distance of the school. So really, I mean, what chance is there in those schools of, of encouraging more people, more children and more parents to allow their children to walk and cycle to school? And we've broadly similar statistics for every year that we've run the programme for the last six years. And I think there's five of these schools are in your Strangford constituency, Madam uh, Chairperson. Just a couple of examples, Millennium Integrated Prime I mean, St. Field, it's got a 50 or 60 mile an hour speed limit outside, no traffic calming, no road crossing. Uh, Car Primary School in Lisburn, even worse, it's got no footpaths either. You know, so it's just really, really challenging in those schools. And I think we did send around the full audit report if you want to look at schools in, in your constituencies. So the second, the second thing we'd really like to see is more greenways and protected paths. We've seen the huge success of Coleswater Community Greenway, Cumber Greenway, you know, where they've been constructed, the Sam Thompson Bridge, you can see a picture of that. It's revolutionised my cycle to work. I used to have to go along the Sydenham Bypass, which is hideous. Now I go through a park with trees and swans. It's lovely. Uh, I was on the Waterford Greenway during the summer. And I was blown away by the hundreds and hundreds of people cycling mm. there. And I think we're missing a massive trick around tourism, the greenways. I mean, the cafes were buzzing, the towns were heaving, uh, cafes and bike hire had sprung up all along the routes. You know, massive, massive tourist potential there. But we also need safer in infrastructure where people live and work so they can commute or shop or just go about their everyday lives. Uh, the picture at the bottom of that slide on page 12 is London. The, uh, the Mayor's transport strategy in London prioritises the role of streets to improve health and well-being, creating low-traffic neighbourhoods to include walking and cycling. Um, so the third action we'd like to see is uh, active travel hubs to support behaviour change, because we've seen really good success at CS Lewis Square active travel hub. Uh, you know, because uh, we've been able to run programmes for families, for women returning to cycling, for workplaces and many others. Because infrastructure is great, absolutely, but many people will require a bit of support and encouragement to, to start cycling again. And we know the biggest benefits and impact comes whenever we can marry infrastructure and behaviour change. And then the last thing I just want to touch on is the idea of multimodal journeys. So if you can walk or cycle to a railway station or a bus station, get on public transport and then walk or cycle at the other end. Uh, and it's not just about cycle parking, although I put in a couple of pictures there and we've got a lot like the one on the left where there's not much infrastructure and we'd love to get to a position where you had really good uh, cycling provision. But it's also safe routes to stations, some behaviour change support. That could be a much needed boost to public transport. And we might have a lot fewer cars trying to drive into Belfast if we had more people using the trains from Lisburn, Bangor uh, and other places. 
and we know there is support for change. Across the UK, we did a survey last year uh, of a number of cities, and 78% of people said that they supported taking space away from cars and creating space for walkers and people on bicycles. Uh, and with 67% of people in Belfast said that. Now, that's not what you usually hear reported in the Belfast Telegraph. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, and this survey was conducted last year uh, before COVID, and I think there is increased support now for walking, creating space for walking and cycling. So I think we need to take bold decisions, but I think that they can be taken in the knowledge that the majority of people actually support them. Um, so that's a quick run through, I think, some of the things that, that we believe are important and I'm very happy to answer any questions and thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you and I suppose really the, the, um, the final comment that you made in relation to the level of support certainly has increased, particularly during Covid um, and I suppose we were also quite blessed with the weather at that time too, yes. so <laughs> we had quite a substantial increase then in the number of walkers and cyclists and certainly um, and, and I think this is probably one of the, these topics that we will actually get quite parochial but um, in, in Cumber, I, my office in Cumber and I see obviously in a lot of cyclists mm -hmm. just by virtue of the Cumber Greenway and the proximity mm -hmm. of that and obviously people coming into um, the town but that has actually quite it's been fairly well sustained even though we're now moving sort of mm -hmm. into sort of the winter too which is actually really encouraging mm -hmm. so it is about in, improving that mm -hmm. infrastructure too to allow that behavioural change. Mm -hmm. I'm interested really from Liz's perspective, obviously you've come into this role, it's a new role um, and I suppose it's got lots of challenges to it, but really for you, I mean, there are lots of competing priorities within the department mm -hmm. and I suppose it's very difficult for you to be critical of, of other divisions, but really f for you personally, what are your challenges moving forward? I think I think my um, main challenge is around culture change, and it's not just about culture change within the department, it's culture change for all of us. Um, I mean, we're coming from a situation where for years and years and years, traffic progression has been seen as the most important thing, and your right to have your car and drive everywhere. Um, has kind of been seen as a you know a given so we're now getting into a situation where you know we're saying that you know actually that's not a terribly good idea in all cases and that where we can change we really should be changing but given the setup that we have um you know every time you know you try and take something away and that's how it feels you know you're taking a car parking space away you're taking a lane away it feels like um, motor motorists feel like they're losing something um, and so it becomes very difficult so I suppose my biggest challenge at the moment is trying to trying to see that culture change and part of it is about trying to build consensus and build coalitions as I say I've spent the summer doing an awful lot of work with the councils um, to try and get um, to try and get into a space where we're bringing stakeholders together now that's a much easier task in some councils than others not because of anything the council is doing but because in areas where public transport is good and population density is high it becomes much easier you know there are other areas where it is a much much harder ask and it's not really practical for a lot of people to go the whole hog in terms of sort of trade in the car for a bike but there are smaller things that we can do um, and and I suppose you know Caroline's pointed out that that, you know, we say, you know, the department um, does have a constrained budget, but there are priorities here um, that um, it actually is much cheaper to provide cycling and walking infrastructure than it is to provide um, roads infrastructure. Um, but, you know, there is political consensus that a lot of those big roads projects that we're doing are very important and are important for the economy. So this is about, I think it's about leadership and it's about consensus and it's about partnership. Of course, none of the things which are being suggested here are revolutionary either. They are best practice yeah. in so many other towns and cities across the United yeah. Kingdom and then into Europe as well. And, and particularly the piece around multimodal um, journeys mm. too. It's, um, you know, it's, it makes sense that you, or if you're able to, you know, if you have a bike that you can park it safely for the day and be able mm. to return to that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, as you say, there are challenges, particularly mm. in, in rural areas that's po mm. not possible, but, but I suppose given 
the issues, of, in particularly around Belfast for parking mm. and the challenges associated with that being financial as well as anything mm. else, um, and obviously the um, and pollution, it does make sense that we then do provide that. Um, the Greenways projects are something which has really sort of driven councils over the last number of years, and, and people have really taken to particularly mm. we've got excellent models such as, as mm. um, a Cons Water, mm. and we're looking to improvements obviously on, on the Cumber Greenway. Mm. And as I said, it is encouraging to see some of the people that you meet. Yesterday morning, I met um, Gordon Clark in, in Cumber in, in the square with his wife. She'd walked mm. the Cumber Greenway and he cycled it. Um, so, um, but just to see that's actually really is, is encouraging. Mm. But there are challenges around greenways too, and you'll know um, with regards to land ownership. Yes. And I suppose the approach that some councils mm. have taken has probably been better than others. Mm. I suppose by bringing people along with you. Um, in hindsight, is there a better approach that you can see in order to, I suppose, have a realisation of some of these mm. projects? Do you want me to start? Or? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I suppose, um, you know, in hindsight and certainly looking at some of the issues around land acquisition um, for some of the um, councils, I think one of the things that we've learned certainly from looking at the way they've gone ahead with the Waterford Greenway is, look, just bank what you can. So if you can't get a full route, just take it a piece at a time, do a bit at a time. Um, you will often find um, what they found in Waterford was that as certain, um, once they completed certain sections, people who were um, more reticent about other sections saw the success of a section and it kind of brought them along. It is, it's a long-term relationship building um, program. It's, it, it, it is time consuming and people are impatient to see change and to see it now. But I mean, even if you look at something like the Conswater Greenway, which is incredibly successful, you know, the council and all its partners did a brilliant job in delivering that. But you know, it took more than 10 years. Um, but because they built those relationships, particularly with the community as they went along, I think that's what the success of the project is. Um, so in terms of what the councils have done so far, I think it, it's really a case of taking the easy wins first and working on the basis that if you show success, the other bits are more likely to follow. I know from speaking to some landowners, they feel that there's a fait accompli whenever a, perhaps a, a, a project is being developed mm. and they haven't maybe been brought along. Mm. And there is a, there's always the threat then of vesting um, which particularly if you have a farm and yeah. it's been in your in your family for generations that become very difficult um, okay we've never vested for a greenway I'm not yeah. saying that you know, it, I mean obviously it's it's there but um, the biggest success elsewhere has been permissive agreements so it's it's not even um, necessarily um, transferring land ownership, it's getting an agreement that the land can be used. That kind of gives a bit more security as well, I think, to the landowner in that, you know what, if it's a real disaster, they can back away from it. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and obviously the, the issue just finally for me in relation to um, safe skills, I think whenever you look at the information that you provide, it's actually quite stark and really, really worrying. Mm -hmm. And we'll all have various examples of skills around our areas. And while the 20 mile per hour speed limit is a start it's not the only thing no. which will actually make a difference um, you know it's it's there's so much more that is required and around that i have seen the skills streets and the safe streets around mm -hmm. skills so it'd be actually quite interesting if you could maybe share a bit more information in relation to that and then how that could possibly be achieved Yes, I mean, we, we would like, I mean, what we'd really like to do is uh, align that with, with the Active School Travel Programme uh, and have, I suppose, more joined, a more joined up approach between infrastructure and behaviour mm. change. I mean, so what, what you could do with, uh, at school, uh, with some schools is, is pilot the School Streets Initiative, obviously with you know, the, the schools who are interested and willing, and I understand there are a number of schools who already are. Uh, you know, work with the school community, work with the local community, uh, and the idea is that it's 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 um, it's really just sort of traffic calming uh, at either end mm. of the of the street. 
that they are uh, that there are signs up that uh, and whether it's planters or, or things that sort of restrict access but they don't restrict access completely people residents can still move through emergency services can still move through but the idea is it cuts school uh, through traffic for people who are just using it as a rat run to, to, to get through or to drop off their children uh, and so it becomes a much more uh, just pleasant place to be where it's safe where there's limited traffic what traffic there is is moving very very slowly and it's for you know 45 minutes around you know between half eight and nine fifteen or something in the morning and then what do we know three till quarter to four whatever in the afternoon um uh, so there, there are a number of pilots hap happening at the moment and certainly we can feed back on the results of those whenever, whenever we have that. But it seems that, you know, although this, and there's always some resistance initially when anything like this is set up, uh, well, it seems that, you know, after a few weeks people get used to it and actually it works well. You know, and it's aligned to this idea of sort of low traffic neighbourhoods, which is also being piloted where actually that's more, more permanent, it's not just at school times. But the idea is that it's only local residents who are able to drive through the areas. And although at the beginning people mm. were saying, oh, no, this is terrible. What we're finding later on when you go back and survey a few months mm. later, nobody wants to return to the way it was before because it's actually working very mm. well. So, you know, we think the school, school streets in particular, I think, could be piloted quite easily. It doesn't particularly need resources. Uh, and we could certainly provide some more information on how that might work in practice, but certainly would really like to see a, a greater alignment of where because there are some improvements, infrastructure improvements that happen at schools, mm. but it's not aligned to the active school travel programme. And also, from what I understand, it's 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 they're decided on by you know whether children have been killed or seriously injured, rather than looking at what is the opportunity to change. Where can we mm. actually promote? So if nobody's died there, you know it's sort of regarded as fine. And maybe nobody's died there because nobody in their right mind would ever consider crossing the road. <laughs> uh, so, as, mm. uh, so I think it's just about change. Look, actually looking at what, what is our opportunity to change? What can we do proactively to really boost walking and mm. cycling uh, 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 and, and, and have more, fo more focus on that? And maybe we can do it by mm. you know, looking at a cluster of schools. I know Liz and I have discussed the idea of taking a place and, look, mm. and working with a cluster of schools and seeing if, if you can have greater impact by doing it like that. Uh, but certainly we would like to trial out uh, a number of, of new approaches because behaviour change is great and it makes a big difference. But really, if you've got no footpath to your school, what are the chances of families walking mm. to school? You know, they're very, very low. OK, thank you. Mr Boylan. Thanks, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation. You're very welcome. Um, and Caroline, I'll have to take you out of those big urban settings back down yes. to the rural areas. Okay. Um, no, I mean, there's, I think there's a great opportunity. The Middletown, the Smithborough to mm. Middletown Greenway down in my own constituency mm. is 22 kilometres, 13.2 mm. miles in old money. Um, but there's a good opportunity there. But it's not mm. only about the Greenway and active travel, it's about helping enhance the village itself. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like the likes of community plans within councils yeah. and area plans, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity to develop mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. whole village. I mean, and and that's a key point. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm I'm, I'm keen on and definitely not agreeing with all our members will talk about their own areas, but just one because mm -hmm. there's an opportunity there now. Mm -hmm. and I know it's ongoing at the minute, and I'm keen, yeah. and would like your support in that any any way you can. But Liz, I just uh, want to go back to what we've learned from lockdown. Yeah. Was I mean there was a key opportunity there. People themselves took it mm -hmm. upon themselves, no matter how much encouragement. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. What have we, have we utilised it? What have we learned from it? What can we bank from it? And how do we move forward in terms of could more have been done or where, where are we at? Right, right across the board, even in terms of Caroline and myself, mm. but in terms of the department. Um, well, I suppose just before I come on to that, just in terms of the Middletown Greenway, um, you know, the, the key to the success of that Greenway is going to be getting the link into the village, right? Because the, you know, in terms of Greenway development, it's, it, it's not coming right into the heart of the village. And I think that, you know, if, if we can crack that, it, really, it becomes really important in terms of tourism as well for the mm -hmm. village. But that aside, in terms of what we learned from lockdown, um, <laughs> I think in some way it was a sense of, look, just do it. Um, one of the examples I would always use is the, the stretch of cycleway at Middle Path Street. Um, took us three years um, to design, consult, 
consult again, design again, consult again, build, and then correct the deficiencies. Um, the um, section at Dublin Road took us three weeks. Um, and now there is... Uh, what we did on the Dublin Road is not without opposition, but I suspect that if we'd taken three years to deliver it, we would still have issues with the... We would still have the same issues. Um, so, yeah, I think what we need to do is be targeted about consultation, um, talk to people, and also, if, if you've... If you've um, invested three years in a scheme, um, you kind of become a bit stuck in it. Whereas something like the Dublin Road, you know, if you've t if it's taken you three weeks, you're in a position where you know what if it doesn't work and if the community hates it, we'll just move it. You know, sometimes it's a case of saying we've tried this, it was a mistake. Although I don't believe, I mean, I'm not talking about Dublin Road being a mistake, but. It, you know, just that whole sense of just trying things and being open to things and saying, let's give it a go. If it doesn't work, we'll stop it. Um, so as we move forward sort of into this next phase, um, we are looking at extending um, out. Um, we had originally intended to extend out to the city hospital um, and that had been delayed because Phoenix were doing some work. So that delay, although it was frustrating at the time, has actually been quite useful for me because what it's allowed me to do is look in light of what happened on the Dublin Road and in light of how people felt about various bits can we do anything better so what we've done in terms of the Donegal Road is to put in what I think will be an uncontroversial section and then a section where I know that um, shop shopkeepers in particular might have issues to actually say you know what maybe we can do a different, a slightly different <laughs> solution here and do a better job. So I think the learning has been, don't be afraid to try something and then step away from it if it's not working. And if I could just go back mm. to what you said about greenways, I think that's absolutely mm. right. I mean, I think they can bring such a, a boost to local towns and villages. And I really witnessed that this summer. I mean, I was on my own holidays as well. And I, you know, I chose to go to a greenway, uh, the Waterford to Dungarvan. And in Dungarvan, that town was buzzing. They said new restaurants had opened, new B&Bs had opened. And all the little villages along that route, had, there were cafes, there was a real boost, there was bike hire. There were loads of families who had made an effort to go there for a, for a trip. And, and so, but I think Liz's point about making sure that the village is then included mm -hmm. and there's links from the greenways to other, other points of, of interest is really, really critical. But I think greenways can be a real sort of anchor mm -hmm. for, for uh, renewed tourism and e economic growth in areas and I think it's but I think it's also really important that we have a, a strategic approach to greenway development across Northern Ireland so we have a network and my only concern with it all being devolved out to councils mm. is that it might be piecemeal and fragmented mm. and they won't necessarily join up mm. again across council boundaries and then not yeah. deliver that sort of strategic <laughs> network that mm. the department is looking for. No, and I appreciate what you said about Middletown. We just need to be a wee bit creative about that yeah. and be a bit more ambitious mm. because the community plans and area plans definitely give a big opportunity. I know mm. the community plans have been developed, but those things should be looked at. Just two, two or four of the quick points. There's, and I mean, obviously, to both of in terms of the old, um, obviously, people are concerned about safety, especially cyclists. And, and the old, and the old system was a white line painted on the road. You, Nowadays, they've introduced more you know, mm. robust measures. Are those old white lines the thing of the past? Are we moving forward now to more secure, to encourage people, especially mm. cyclists? And I've seen some on the slides there. OK, in terms of that whole advisory cycle lane and white lines, um, they do not work in most places mm. now. So our preference would be for segregated cycle <coughs> lanes. Now, there are a very, very few cases where you might do that. Um, it's permissible within the guidance, um, but it, it would be it would be sort of 
it, it's like shared paths. Um, you know, generally we would be against shared paths because they don't really work either for cyclists or pedestrians. But in areas where there is low pedestrian footfall and there is no other alternative to provide a cycle path, yes, we would tend to say, well, actually, it's better a shared path than no path at all. And I suppose that the same thing is the, for the advisory cycle lanes. In a very, very few circumstances, yes, they might be um, the only option, but I think generally we would work quite hard to make sure that there is a proper segregated path. Um, I don't and, I, and I think it, what, for me, what's really important is mm. that they're joined up and they don't mm. just stop where you mm. need them you, when you're coming to the junction or the roundabout, mm. which is usually mm. what happens. There are new design standards mm. which have been brought in for cycling infrastructure, and I'd really mm. like to see those being adopted. Yeah. And that it's not just seen as something that's nice to do if you've got loads of space, mm. but actually it being given priority. And it mm. shouldn't always be the add-on. It should be an integral part of yeah. any new road route, any reappraisal or any mm. road works going mm. on. But, and also that we should make some difficult decisions. Maybe we can take a bit of space away from cars in order to give more to mm. walkers and cyclists. OK, and finally, Chair, um, active travel legislation. I mean, a lot of people have been talking about it. <coughs> In your assessment of it and how it can help. Bear in mind just what you have to say on a bit about cycle lanes. Okay, well, the, um, we had done some preparatory work back in 2016 in terms of an active travel bill. Um, the Minister has asked me to have a look at that. She's asked me for a range of other information around that. Um, she is looking at options for sort of policy change um, and also looking at the potential for legislative change. So, she, I mean, she's actually looking at that at the moment. Is, is there any consideration being given to a dedicated uh, Greenways unit within the department, just taking on board the sort of fragmented mm. nature of, of various councils um, towards that and actually seeing some of these projects then from start to finish as opposed to leaving it to councils to deliver? Okay, well, there is a Greenways team within the active travel branch, but I mean, it's a very, very, given that this, how small the active travel branch is. Um, the, um, in terms, are you, are you, do you mean um, that the department delivers Greenways rather than the well, council? Or? Well, I'm sort of thinking that someone perhaps maybe needs to sort of take it all in and mm. have oversight rather than it just being left to councils. And then, you know, there's a, a consultative nature. I suppose the relationship with the department as opposed to actually the department driving it, um, which isn't really, I think at the moment then we're not really sort of saying delivery, yeah. whereas if someone were actually going to take charge of it, then you might actually see the transformation that everybody's looking for. Okay, as Caroline says, we do have a um, Greenway strategy, which is in the, which is kind of strategic direction. Um, I have been speaking, I have spoken to not quite every council, but nearly every council and their Greenways officers about Greenways. So I'm trying to bring that focus to it. Um, the, um, the gap, um, as you say, is, you know, we have the strategic view here, but what the, the council's priorities don't always match exactly what the strategic um, view is. Chair, that's on the budgetary issue. I mean, that's why I mentioned about mm. the more joined up for serious, because there's big benefits. Mm. I mean, I know the difference in the councils is because of general. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure every, I'm not, I'm not sure that every council sees the greenways as their priority. Mm. Um, it, it, because of the funding. Yeah. If the, if the funds, some of the. This is seen as a luxury item as mm. opposed to a necessity, mm. and if it's something that um, the assembly sees as important, and it's mm. certainly something that you know, mm. that we're all bought into. Mm. And I think it would it would show a much more mm. positive message if mm. it was being driven more centrally. Mm. Yes, um, I suppose the it's not something that we've looked at at all um, beyond sort of the conversations. The um, I mean, most of the council—I was going to say most of the council. I suppose most of the councils who are talking to me about greenways are very interested mm. in greenways, but that's obviously kind of a circular argument in itself. The um, I, I think the. I think the the um, hiatus when you know we were read the 
DFI was ready to go with a green waste support program and then um, the, um, the assembly not being in place for three years and no ministers, there had been kind of, a, they'd taken their foot off the gas really in terms of green waste development. So now when I was saying to them, okay, we have the money and it's ready, you know, if it's ready to go, um, I think some of them are in a sort of slower than they might have been, um, but they do seem to be working to catch up. But I entirely accept your point, Chair, that not all councils are in the same place and not all have the same views. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mm. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I would declare at the outset I was previously a member of Ards North Down for a council and also a volunteer with SUS Trans. Get out of the way. <laughs> um, just a couple of things, just touching upon the issue in terms of the engagement with councils to bring forward the. Um, the Greenways. Mm. I think that's really important that uh, some of the issues that have been teased out mm. here by the two previous contributors about that engagement with the mm. councils, and I welcome the fact that you've engaged with with them. Um, you're the walking and cycling champion, Liz, as far mm. as I understand. Yes. Uh, from the public perspective, it's a bit of an enigma because a lot of people have been asking who is the walking and cycling champion, so we can unveil you today. Uh, how much, <coughs> in terms of your job, do you dedicate to that role? Because I'm just conscious of the need to put resources to this, and how much are you able to dedicate towards that position? Um, it's, that's quite a difficult question, to be honest. In the, you know, in the, to me, the, the the role of the walking and cycling champion is about making sure that it is the heart of everything else that I am doing. So when I am sort of working on transport plans, am I acting as walking and cycling champion? To me, yes, I am. If you're talking about kind of the outward facing role of walking and cycling champion, um, at the moment, that's probably taking up between sort of walking and cycling champion plus the blue green infrastructure is probably about 75%. Um, of my time, but I would argue that the the way that the minister has conceived of the role of walking and cycling champion, it, it's a it, that everything I do now is with that walking and cycling um, role in mind. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I think it's important to put that focus because on the slide from Caroline, which mm. is around the active travel spending. It really is quite stark reading in terms of the level yeah. of investment for Northern Ireland. And just really, from your professional opinion, why have we managed, why have we got into such a situation where it is so low compared to the rest of the UK and Ireland? It's you know because that's that, that's holding back an awful lot in North, uh, that needs to be done. Honestly, I think that there were there have been a number of choices made over a number of years, and walking and cycling. Um, has been not as high priority as spending money in some other areas and budgets are limited. Um, now, it's, it is about priorities, um, as Caroline had said. In terms of, like, for example, the Republic of Ireland's at 66 pounds, mm. maybe from Caroline's perspective, why have they managed to be able to get to such a, a, a level? Well, they have decided that 20% of their entire transport budget will be devoted to, to active travel. Mm -hmm. I think ours is... <laughs> you know, I, I, my understanding, a couple of years ago, our transport budget was £437 mm -hmm. million, you know, uh, and we... And, and We've, I think we are yes. probably less than four million. Of yes, that, you know, yeah. so it's it's we're we're a very yeah. very small percentage. So they've they've been able to do it there because they've made a political choice. Yeah. they're going to do twenty percent. You know, we could make that decision as well yeah. if the political will were there. Yeah, and and the, the question is, yeah, that's brilliant. So of what the of um you know the of what the transport budget has already been spent on, which twenty percent becomes the active travel budget. I think it's an important issue and it's a political mm. decision that's going to need to be made because we need leadership in this. Um, and I welcome, mm. like, for example, the Blue Green Fund, but mm. it's going to drop in the ocean compared to what needs to be done. Mm. Um, just two other issues. The active travel hubs. Um, when I was up in Derry in February mm. before the pandemic, so life before the mm. pandemic, life afterwards, mm. uh, I visited the, the new uh, transport hub. 
and I know that part of that's meant to have an active travel centre. Mm. I just wanted to do an update about whereabouts that is and if there's plans to roll that out to other areas because it was in the CS Lewis Square mm. uh, a few weeks ago and that was very busy. Mm. And I was just be interested to see if we can get more of those rolled out across Northern Ireland. Okay, I haven't been closely involved, but I maybe just say where the, I think the department is if you want to. Yes, go ahead. Um, okay, the department um, had made an application to the SEUPB in terms of funding for the dairy hub. Now, as far as I'm aware, there has been no decision there, but um, I will actually check that. And um, if I'm incorrect on that, I'll write to the committee with more information on it. Um, in terms of the next hub after this, what well, after Derry, um, it will be at the Belfast, um, the new Belfast um, tra travel centre, the new Belfast travel hub. Sorry. Yeah. So. Caroline? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very keen to see the one mm. in, in, in Derry uh, actually being used because mm. the, the, the facility is built and it gets the revenue funding to actually run it as mm. a, you know, an information centre and running lead mm. rides, behaviour change programmes, bike maintenance, all of that. Uh, and we're, you know, we're, we're really keen to, mm. to, to be able to, to do that. We'd love to see that in, in, in all uh, railway stations. Some of the other hubs, the one in C.S. Lewis Square, that's more at the centre of a community uh, linked into local community organisations, local mm. employers, so they, you know, they, they can be multifaceted. But I think having them at, at mm. transport nodes is, is really good at promoting that end-to-end -end mm. journey concept, that multimodal uh, journey. So we would love to see more, more of those developed. So we'd be keen to see the one in Derry brought to fruition. Mm. You know, from reading the newspapers yesterday, it was people talking about the, the official opening of the transport hub, but mm. without the active travel centre, it's a key part of the jigsaw. Mm. It needs to be there, and there is a greenway that links all the way down yeah. to that. Um, so it would be really keen. Mm. I think I understand with the transport hub, mm. I would care if previously an employee of Translink, but um, but that's going to be a couple of years away, mm. and there's a real need to bring this out to just beyond C.S. Lewis Square mm. and Derry and Belfast. So I think mm. it's something that needs to be actively explored and lastly just briefly around the sort of safer schools initiatives and stuff like that the, there was an announcement made about the 20 miles an hour real annoyance in north down that no schools were included mm. within that and i think there really needs to be a greater focus put not just as the chair has said mm. on the 20 miles an hour but on just as a greater mm. investment around those issues because um you know parents are contacting me just really concerned children have been knocked down outside schools mm. when they want to see tangible actions really are, are around this mm. so it'll be interesting to see if there's any further funding that's mm. going to come forward for those schemes okay thank you Liz Kimmins thanks chair and um, thanks to to Liz and, and Caroline um, I suppose a lot of a lot a lot of this the stuff has been has been discussed at length uh, already. Uh, my particular question would be around of a couple, but just um, particularly around the um, the the twenty mile an hour zones outside schools. I see that only seventeen percent or seventeen percent of schools have fifty to sixty uh, mile per hour limits outside their gates, which is is really not ideal. Um, and just as as uh, Caroline had mentioned there, the fact that actions really only taken when someone is killed um is really really disappointing and it's something i'd heard in the past but i mean it's it's shocking that it has to come to that before action is taken obviously as uh, liz had mentioned in in her um part that the minister has started the, the rollout of the 120 mile an hour zones um has that put a, de a dent really in the statistic around the 50 and 60 mile an hour zones outside schools is, is that having an impact um because I, I would I, obviously we've been we've been lobbying hard to have this extended to all schools and um, so that all schools have a 20 mile an hour zone outside um, to try and improve safely sorry I'm, i didn't catch the actual question is it about rolling out to more schools or is was it about 50, 50 and 60 mile per hour zones. Sorry, I just didn't catch the. Um, no, you're okay. No, it was. I was. The question was just really to to see if the hundred schools that have been announced as as um, getting the twenty mile an hour zones is that having an impact on those schools that have currently have or or have had a fifty or sixty mile an hour zone outside their school is is it having an impact on those you know, to, to bring that down? Okay. Thank you. Sorry about um, yet yeah, the um, 
In some cases, yes, um, but it won't pick up every school that has a 50 to 60 mile per hour, mile per hour limit outside. Um, I, I suppose there's the two, two, um, two things happening. Um, Firstly, the 100 zones, I, the Minister is keen that there will be more zones rolled out next year, so that's the first 100. And the second point then is the things that Caroline and I have been talking about, that 20 mile an hour zones are a first step, um, but if you don't have the proper infrastructure, it doesn't really matter. Um, it doesn't, you know, it makes a bit of a difference. It doesn't make enough of a difference. Um, we can do... Putting infrastructure in will help that. Um, the other point there is we would need to as well do behavioural change work if we really want kids to walk and cycle to school, um, and that has to be done in conjunction with that. So I see this as kind of the first step of what is pretty much a multi-step programme, um, and you know the longer-term aim has to really, I think, to be about getting cars away from school gates altogether. Yeah, no, no, that's fair enough. And I agree with you, I suppose. Um, and one, I suppose one of the issues I'm consistently raising is around in at rural schools where there's a national speed limit outside mm. schools. It's, it's not as straightforward to just put the 20 mile an hour zone in. Um, and it's something I've, I've been raising with the department. Um, it, as you said there, Liz, one of the, the issues is, is the, having the proper infrastructure. And, and in the report you'd mentioned, um, formerly Clogg Primary School with St. Menendez Primary School, which is my constituency, um, and there have been moves to reduce the speed limit there anyhow. Um, but I know things like road linkage, like footpaths and things are missing and, and there's other examples in this area uh, of that. Um, so it was really to see the department looking at that in terms of putting in road crossings because I know um, there's 73% there's of schools have no road crossing within walking distance and there's 35% with an urgent need of road crossing. So are the department looking at that in, in conjunction with the 20 mile an hour zones? Um, and is that something we, you know, we should be looking at for all schools? Um, I don't know about that specific um, school, but in general, yes, um, we look at um, improving walking and improving crossings. Now, it's not always linked directly to the school. Um, so again, with some of the work that Caroline and I are doing, we're trying to find a way to pull all that together um, and potentially pilot something before looking more widely. Certainly, this was one of our criticisms. There's been such a small number of schools get improvements each mm. year. It's, you yeah. know, it's a very you know, single, mm. yeah, yeah. three or four schools, I think, are getting, mm. in, and we really need to see that rolled out on a much, mm. much bigger level. Yeah, and I think even, you know, in my experience from raising issues and trying to get traffic calm and, tra you know, things like that at, at schools, the criteria sometimes mm. doesn't enable it. Um, so, I think the approach of looking at active travel as opposed to how many cars are on that road, mm. um, you know, improving active, tra active travel rather than looking at it, as you said earlier, have there been any deaths? That, I think that's the way forward on this. Mm. Would it be possible is to get a list of those schools that are, are classified as an urgent need of uh, a road crossing? Um, I will certainly ask my roads colleagues. I'm not sure in what form they hold the list, but I'll see what we can produce and write to the committee. Madam Chair. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's that's fair enough. Um, just a, another thing, I suppose that you mentioned the rural safe routes to school program. Could we get a wee bit more detail on that? Um, as I mentioned, there are rural schools in my consistency have been kind of some of the key ones that I've been lobbying for. So be interested to know a bit more about that. That, that was a, a program actually that Sustrans delivered for the department. So it's over ten, it's ten years mm -hmm. ago now. So that was actually l looking at this very mm -hmm. issue of how do we get children to school mm -hmm. safely, and it was a program specifically in in rural areas, uh, and that showed you know very significant improvements and and good results. Uh, and it, I think it also highlighted the, the, the benefit of having infrastructure and behaviour change mm. married together. So there was an evaluation of that programme, it was successful, but it wasn't continued whenever the funding uh, ended. So mm. that's, we would love to see that uh, mm. uh, reinvigorated. Mm. Okay. Would it be possible even to get some information on what that entailed and, and maybe we could look at 
you know, speaking to the department about that, if something as well as the committee we could consider. I could certainly forward you a copy of the evaluation report that was, mm -hmm. that was completed. That would be great, yeah. That, that's all I've got my questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. You're very mm. welcome. And thanks for your presentation mm. so far. Um, we just weren't just lucky in East Antrim. There was a proposed uh, Green May between Green and Monkstown mm. a couple of years back, but unfortunately, a local councillor went and spoke to all the residents on that and told them there was going to be break ins, beer, there was going to be drinking, and all sorts of things. And then there was a public meeting. I think the officers near get paid at it, so mm. a very negative response, mm. unfortunately. But maybe I'm, he I'm hearing it may be coming back on the table mm. with that. But uh, that was a bad experience, to be honest. Mm -hmm. with, but we were getting some. Uh, the 20 million hours at the schools and whatnot and stuff, and we have been successful myself in that, getting one into Carrick there with lights and all. Mm. But in your discussions with the Education Authority, when they, they seem to be just on a systematic goal right now of getting, uh, doing away with lollipop men. Mm. Which, if you're trying to create a proper and a safe mm. route to school for kids, yourselves are doing something good at one end of it, and they're taking the benefit and bed out and the whole thing at the other end of it again. Have you had any discussion with the Education Authority? Okay, I'm not aware of any discussion that's gone on. I will check with my road safety colleagues. Um, sorry, I honestly don't know. I will check with them and um, add it to the response to the committee just to follow up. I see, I think they thought mm. you're taking an advantage of the good works that mm. we are doing, and then they're the sake of 9,000 pounds mm. taken away. Yeah. Also, you, you were mentioning the multi-model journeys where you end up with mm. stuff. Um, maybe Andrew would be able to answer this for me. Uh, <laughs> there used to be a case that you couldn't actually get a, a bicycle on a train coming into Belfast after 10 o'clock in the morning. Half nine. What then? Half nine. Half nine, Half nine. Half nine was it? <laughs> Which sort of doesn't really work as well because people were looking to get on their bike mm. at the other end. The other end go to wherever they were heading up to work, because mm. obviously the stations just aren't always financed where they're working. Mm. Uh, have you had any discussions with TransLink on that at all? Or? Yeah, I've had a number of discussions with TransLink about this, particularly during the um, during the first lockdown when there was a lot of space on trains. Um, TransLink's approach, um, or TransLink's current preferred approach, is um, to provide cycle parking at stations. So you cycle to the station, leave your bike in a secure lockup, you take the train or take the bus, and then um, you either walk or pick up a higher cycle, or an, I suppose a second owned cycle at the other side. I a yeah. I would be very keen to at least try, again, just try a pilot, try something yeah. small, try it on one route um, and just see what happens. Um, I am talking to TransLink about that because, you know, again, it's this sense that, like, let's try it. If it's a disaster, we can stop it. Okay. Mm. Because we've seen it, I think it's at Scotland, is, mm. is now looking to have yeah. additional carriages on their train specifically. For, for bicycles, and certainly we'd love to see more bicycles mm. being able to be carried uh, and at earlier yeah. time as well. Mm. Well, that'd be great now. Mm. Uh, you, you did mention 20 million in the budget for blue green stuff. Do you know what that's going to be spent on, or what it's earmarked for? Um, some of it um, is already earmarked, um, some of it we're still developing. So, um, very roughly. Um, okay, five million has gone into the um, partnership with DFC and DERA on COVID revitalisation, and that's gone out to the councils, um, and they are working on their the letters of offer have issued, and they're working on their plans at the moment. Um, so far, um, we have. So what, so what, would that, what would that be used for? Um, it's um, the DFC element of the fund is really focused on town centres and sort of helping businesses recover from the pandemic. Some of it's gone into grant funding. Some of it has gone into public realm improvements. The 
DFI um, contribution then um, that matches that has been more about um, trying to create connections, so providing more space for walking, providing more space for cycling, or turning um, parking spaces into parklets, improving accessibility for disabled people, um, also looking at um, not just within town centres but outside of town centres, things like looking at connections, say, between local shops and houses, um, either improving pathways or lighting pathways. So there's a whole range of things um, in that space at the moment. Some of it's about providing cycle parking, but the, each council has its own sort of mini plan. Um, and so it's, DF, it's DFI's money plus either DFC or DERA money, depending on whether it's a rural town or um, an urban town. Um, so that's... Um, there's an awful lot of work going on in councils at the moment on that. Um, Okay, then, um, so far we've issued, we have allocated 3.735 million to Greenways. Not all of that will be spent this year. Um, there is about um, not nearly four million pounds um, on small walking and cycling schemes. Um, so those are the work that our own, that our roads colleagues would do in terms of footpath improvements or providing um, a new cycling infrastructure. Um, also, um, a number of pilots. Um, there's currently about one million pounds allocated to support pilots with councils. Some of it's already been spent on things like pop-up cycle lanes. Um, there are a fair number of other initiatives that are under consideration um, and that the Minister is considering at the moment, some stuff that we're developing as well, um, and she um, has said that she will update you in due course as those come forward. Forward to that. Mm. Thank you. Mr Beggs. <coughs> Liz, you mentioned the, the success of the Belfast Cycling Network, and I would concur that it's, mm. it's great to be able to cycle from Jordanstown, the Belfast mm. City Centre, and along the Lang towpath to, to, to Lisburn, mm. but, uh, and only having to cross the road occasionally. Mm. Um, but there are some gaps when you then link out to the other urban yeah. centres within mm. uh, the Greater Belfast area. Mm. Uh, so what efforts are being made to connect the likes of Carrick and Fergus with the network where there's a relatively short um, uh, restriction? as a result of road width, which is stopping uh, the linkage um, right from the town centre of Carrick Fergus to Belfast and beyond. Okay, I don't know the specific link, and I'm wondering if I could bring my colleague Claire in, who may know the detail. Is that okay, Chair? Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, some, one, some of the, the work we're doing in the Belfast Bicycle Network will reach out that far, um, or will we'll reach out far, but um, maybe not as far as Carrick. Um, but certainly um, every year we are looking at the identify uh, linkages and we have been working over the last number of years to, to, to connect the end of the um, foreshore on out towards Carrick direction. Uh, I can't say off the top of my head, but I can certainly um, find out for, for sure and write to, um, we can write to the committee to update that. But I do know that my colleagues in Rhodes have been working to improve that linkage on out. It's not quite there yet. But it's something they're working on. And in terms of area planning, mm -hmm. um, you know, the planners look at the main motorway developments and spine roads, etc. But are you looking at where there are opportunities to develop uh, uh, cycling and walking routes, and in particular ensure that when there is developer-led mm -hmm. uh, new roads, that it is also developed uh, with um, walking and cycle routes in mind? Okay, at the moment, um, as part of that local development plan process, we are providing councils with um, transport studies, which really looks at their growth aspirations um, look, and, um, and sets out the evidence in terms of what impact that would have on the transport network. Um, and it also um, then includes um, it includes active travel as well as and active travel, public transport and um, cars and also freight movements. Um, the next step to that will be they 
as they produce their plan strategy based on that. Um, the, they should use active travel to answer some of the issues that come up within that um, evidence base. Um, that will all be tested as part of the planning process at IE, uh, sorry, at independent examination. Um, it becomes a bit of an iterative process in that we will be both providing the evidence for and then pushing through the IE to make sure that councils pick up active travel opportunities. In terms of the detail of specific routes, that may not come in until the final stage when they're doing their... Um, their, plan, their local plan policies but as I say it's a bit of an iterative process because there's no point waiting for that to come out if there's things that we can see that need to be done now. The, the, the slide that Sustran has provided us, Caroline, very helpful, uh, is showing a derisory two pound per head of population mm. spent on active travel compared to England 7, Wales 10, mm. Scotland 25 and Republic of Ireland 66. Mm. Why is it so low? Yes. Um, because in terms of the political priorities over the last 30, 40, 50 years here, it has been towards spending the transport budget on things other than active travel. Would, would you accept that um, with COVID, there's been a reawakening of, of um, a variety of travel routes and a willingness of the public uh, to try uh, to improve their health regarding COVID, but also they're learning that it's also better for health generally. And I know my own son is in London and would not have cycled a great deal mm. previously, is now cycling regularly uh, in, into the city of London, and, and along with mm. the remarkable increase mm. of others are doing so, I take it the same is happening uh, in the cycle routes in Belfast? Yeah, I mean, I don't just accept it, like the Minister, I absolutely welcome it. It's, um, you know, the opportunities that exist now um, and the way that people are prepared to think about doing things differently. And I think we have a real window of opportunity here in terms of building on that and making sure that we don't slip back to the automatic way of doing things. And, and then finally, uh, in terms of um, moving forward, uh, early years learned behaviour is very, very important. Mm. And as such, uh, would you accept uh, improving uh, pedestrian access and making it safer access to all our primary schools mm. uh, and local communities, mm. uh, whether it's even just down to local shops, should be a priority so that um, children from a very early age and their parents mm. uh, benefit from walking and don't think automatically of, of, of jumping into a car. Yeah, I think that's really key, you know, getting in at an early age and, you know, trying to encourage people to make the healthier choices at the very start. When will funding go beyond the first 100 schools that have benefited from the recent announcement? The 100 schools is for this year, so that is... Um, that's about the department's capacity to, to deliver within a year. So that's kind of that's the first announcement. Subject to, I mean, obviously we don't know any of our budgets next year um, yet. But I know that the minister um, is keen to continue on that pathway. And I think okay, just what you, you said about the healthier choice, it's how you make the healthier choice the, the, easy, the easier choice as well. And if I, if I might just add one thing, at, at, at your question about Carrick Fergus, I thought was, was very interesting because we actually, you know, I've been looking at this idea of a castle, Carrick Fergus Castle to Bangor Castle mm. cycle route, which would be a wonderful tourist mm. route right along the shore, but it needs uh, cooperation from a number of councils mm. to make that happen, but that could be a, a wonderful... Yeah. And also just highlight it's actually very important to develop the network within the towns mm. as well and actually Carrick Fergus is specifically mm. ripe for developing such mm -hmm. a network with multiple mm -hmm. rights of ways perpendicular to the coast mm -hmm. where farmers used to hold seaweed to their, to their fields mm -hmm. so there's all these rights of ways mm -hmm. along with a couple of mm -hmm. uh, intersections parallel to the coast. Okay thank you Ms Anderson. Uh, thank you, thank you Chair, thank you Liz and Caroline. Um, really interesting what you said but I think all of us are 
quite disappointed when we see the spend per head of mm. uh, population and when you uh, compared, for instance, the north and the mm. south of Ireland, it's stark. Um, and I would like to ask you about improving the multimodal um, journeys for people. Mm. Um, my understanding, like the role of bike sheds mm. uh, is crucially important and changing facilities mm. and how do you get bikes on mm. trains. So what kind of discussions have you had with TransLink around all of that? Um, well, Trans TransLink um, have already are already starting to provide secure travel hubs um, at um, particularly at railway stations. Um, I want to see them roll that out um, um, and provide more of those. Also, the money that we're providing to councils um, through the revitalisation fund, some of them will also be providing secure um, cycle hubs. Um, it's also something that the ministry is, um, is, um, will fund directly. Um, for things like um, our park and ride sites. Um, so the, the secure cycle parking is a really key thing to encourage people to take those multimodal journeys. The um, issue then around um, bikes on trains, I think I had um, said, uh, mentioned earlier that I've been talking to TransLink um, about, look, let's just try a pilot. If it's a disaster, we can stop yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so- It's uh, all over Europe. It happens all over Europe and yeah. it's not a disaster. Um, and I mean, Caroline mentioned there the the train, um, the, they bought extra train carriages for some of the trains in the Highlands to help with the tour, with touring. You know, that will, that will make a massive difference in terms of tourism in those areas. Um, so yeah, more work going on there. Um, the other thing um, that um, we are um, thinking about is, um, is ha ha again i um, talked about this earlier the active travel hub so okay you get to this you get to the railway station or the bus station where do you go from there if you have um, somebody there who is able to signpost you to greenways to safe networks also if you have somebody there who is able to help with bike um, maintenance and fixing issues that again makes a big difference um, and uh, and uh, if i could add that we're, we're having some discussions with TransLink as well around the idea of, of piloting a, you know, mm. a couple of towns uh, but looking as, as well as uh, at what happens at the station but how do we improve the routes to stations whether it's through crossings mm. better walking and cycling infrastructure what what do you need to encourage people who who live quite close who could walk or cycle to the station so mm. it's not just this, the cycle parking once you mm. get there but how you actually improve the routes to those stations um, I'm, I'm aware as are others of the uh the active travel hub in East Belfast mm. and the success mm. uh, of that. And uh, Mr. Muir has mentioned I am uh, an MLA for Derry, so I'm quite um, acutely aware of the Northwest uh, Transport Hub, which has the, the active travel centre that you talked about. Mm. And, you know, the opportunity to have an information point uh, training facility and, you know, secure bike parking, mm. and then having to go to the SEUPB for mm. revenue. And that may be connected to the meagre two pound per mm. head of population uh, that you have outlined for us. Mm. But when you consider like the EU, it was they in 2016, I think the minister was Chris Hazard, who secured mm. the 23 million mm. for, for greenways. Then, you know, we are getting to a point now we can't go to the EU mm. and in search of funding. So it would be good to get an update mm. um, because I'm quite aware of the application mm. that has gone into the SEUPB. Mm. But what's the role of Susten, uh, if yourselves, uh, in trying to take this forward? I know the department has put that in. Have you been involved uh, in the application, for instance, uh, as well? Because just I'm conscious that mm. with not being aware of where that's at, um, are you leaving it to the department just to seek that revenue? Is it up to them? Um, or have you been actively involved in trying to push for the revenue? Because there's no point mm. in having a hub and then if we don't have the revenue uh, to, to make it, to operationalise it in any way at all. It's just another, like, will be considered another white elephant. Mm. I mean, we've been project partners and we have been pushing to try and find out what, what is happening. We, I, in fact, I actually 
emailed the department yeah. earlier this week for an update in that regard because uh, I mean it absolutely the building is there it's built mm. and it just seems crazy that it's not being utilized uh, so yes we, we mm. we're certainly pushing to 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 get a result there and I, I hopefully it just needs a little more of a mm. push to get it over the line and certainly any political support that it that mm. uh, can support that I think will, will mm. make a difference I don't fully understand all the issues why why we're at this sort of impasse mm. But it seems it's a wonderful facility. Let's, you know, let, let's start using it. So, Chair, perhaps that's something that maybe the committee would agree that we could write to the department because as Sustrans is a, a partner mm -hmm. and you're trying to get the information mm -hmm. then, maybe one way to get mm -hmm. it is that we would mm -hmm. commit, as the committee would write, and try and seek that information and obviously we can offer letters of support to the SEUPB or whatever else we need to do. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Ms. Kelly? Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, at this point, there mightn't be much more to add, except I could go through all the greenways and do the lamentable situation around rural schools, which uh, Cahill and, and Liz touched on earlier. But uh, at the outset uh, 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 of the presentation, you talked about the, the strategic way forward and, and uh, some of the disadvantages for councils, you know, in terms of um, whether it was a priority or not, and what funding was available. And in some areas, there is also small clusters of people who don't want to see additional um, traffic, even uh, cyclists through their area. But um, can I ask, uh, local councils, along with DERA and um, through some EU funding in the past, developed village enhancement plans. And we also have work within TEO around urban regeneration. And, uh, so I just wonder how um, all of those things are taken account of and come together and what sort of cross-cutting um, work uh, is being done by yourselves and others uh, to uh, ensure that uh, the projects can come together in a very cohesive way and perhaps can move along a bit quicker because there are other uh, funding opportunities available to them. Um, in terms of the village enhancement plans, um, the um, I have a copy of the relevant parts of all of those plans where they have discussed improving things in terms of walking and cycling, um, and particularly where there are greenway links. So in terms of then the conversations that I'm having with councils, um, those enhancement plans are really good because that's where the consultation's already taken place and where we already know that there is um, community support and community buy-in for those suggestions. So I'm hoping that by relying on those ideas that it will sort of bring things forward a bit faster because a lot of the agreements are already in place. Uh, Liz, you, you may be aware of, um, in particular, the campaign about bridging the banned foot, you know, yes. the mouth between Mary and, uh, and, and uh, there's elements of uh, controversy around it, but I, I would have to say that from my uh, experience and the lobbying that we and my colleagues and council have received, that a lot of people are nearly, who are in support of it, who live in the area, are frightened to speak out because they don't want to fall out with some of their neighbours. But given it's arguably a strategic network, and you did touch on uh, the tourism value uh, uh, of additional product um, that, that some um, greenways and bicycle routes, etc., would bring, I, I just wonder how, what weight is given to a small number of people opposing as opposed to a, a greater campaign by uh, people from across the, the, the wider geographic area and indeed potential users who are not only from Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. but uh, you will be aware of um, the Tour of Rodney cycle. Mm -hmm. um, um, well, it's competition, is it? Uh, uh, we call it the Tour de Ney, you know, over here. I live around the Loch Shore. But, I mean, it has huge potential. People come from across the world now to participate in it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bridge that could potentially deliver a lot in terms of tourism um, and other benefits. Um, but as as you know yourself, it is con there is, it's not without controversy. Um, I have asked, the Minister has asked... Um, 
the council and my team have asked the council a number of times to um, to speak to us about it and to come forward with a view about it. Um, it is not a scheme that's universally supported, as you know, although, you know, we do get um, views from both sides on it. But um, I would be keen for the council to come forward with a view on that. Uh, well, we've been pushing for that at uh, uh, local level and have asked for a consultation exercise to be done by the Community Relations Department, um, which would provide a level of confidentiality for those who are support but mm. uh, don't want their identity necessarily uh, known in the public arena. Mm. Um, the, the, sorry, the only other thing I wanted to ask was around... One of you had mentioned about, again, going back to the tourism product, you know, I mean, coming out of post-COVID, people will be looking for um, a, 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 to diversify their business or to get a new business up and running. And I just wonder, how do we reach out to uh, some areas that are struggling, our business people and entrepreneurs, yeah. uh, if there are um, good products and good examples uh, that could be supported by either the council's economic development departments or through the economy uh, department? department's tourism end you know how can we put some sort of um um brochure if you like together of great ideas this has worked well and let the people then go off and see whether it has a good business case or not to be supported and, and actually to inform the policy of the department of the economy and indeed dera in terms of rural development grants um, to, to actually uh, enable people to get that wee bit of startup funding that might add a lot of value to the overall tourism product. Okay, I represent the department. I represent the minister on um, the tourism recovery steering group, um, and that um, as part of that. Um, I mean, obviously there are a huge number of issues that the group is dealing with at the moment. But one of the things that I have raised with the group is the potential for um, green tourism and active travel tourism. And particularly when you look at um, other European countries, um, the opportunities that exist to bring people here. Um, I mean, obviously the committee had um, done, had approved the legislation on e-bikes um, earlier this year and that you know things like that are the key I think to bringing in tourists from other European countries in particular where that sort of tourism has a really big market. Uh, thank you perhaps chairperson we could um, support uh, the inclusion of some of those ideas uh, and write to the minister or the, or the economic the Tourism Recovery Steering Group to express a view on, on the potential for, for this development. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? This is supplementary. Can I just get some clarification? Obviously, you talked about market towns um, and looking at, at cycling opportunities in and around them. Um, the Belfast bike scheme is obviously has been successful, and I, I wasn't sure whether you were suggesting that that might be something that may be then looked at around some of those towns um it would i suppose it would it's not something i'd rule out it would depend very much on the council's appetite for it obviously the belfast scheme is i think we put in um we did put in some capital startup money from the department i can't remember how much it wasn't a huge amount um and the um the council runs the scheme obviously they have a they've contracted um somebody to run it for them um you need a reasonable um a reasonable population density i think to run those um dairy is clearly ripe for one particularly if you did if you could manage to um use e-bikes in the dairy scheme as well um but I would say that other towns, yes, um, certainly Lisbon maybe would be a good, um, you know, th there are definitely opportunities there, but there is, you do need a certain economy of scale mm -hmm. to make it work financially for the council. Okay, so it hasn't really developed too much in that, I, you know, that we could look at specific towns or having the conversation around specific towns? Um, 
I haven't had any conversations with specific towns about it. I don't know if you've had any. No, 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 we haven't mm. yet. But I think it's certainly worth looking at. I think mm. the success in Belfast has shown mm. that, it, that you know, it, it can really work yeah. and it's really embraced by local mm. people. No, thank you very much and very much sure. appreciate your time. Just one thing, we've talked an awful lot about engagement with the councils and, mm. for example, the, the cycle hire scheme and the greenways. Mm. You should all be very conscious the councils are in a very difficult financial position. So I'm just worried there's an awful lot of focus has been on the councils bringing mm. forward schemes, potential partnership funding and stuff like that. And I think that has to be, and you've said this, mm. it has to be taken into account because it, we're putting a lot of responsibility on the councils to take things forward and I worry that's going to mean that we're actually not going to see the progress we need so something mm. the department really does need to consider you know yeah the um certainly to me the value the value of the relationship with the councils is the partnership and the local consultation um I understand the financial position of a number of councils. Um, that has not, um, we haven't actually ruled anything out on finance terms um, at the moment. Um, the Greenways are a 50 50 split, but on other projects, we've picked up more than 50% of the cost. In fact, on some, a number of them, we've picked up 100%. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to add that there was an e-bike share scheme that was considered by Dairy Council and um, they did a feasibility study and I don't know what happened to it. I think due to budget constraints, mm. it was shelved at least mm. for the time being, but certainly an e-bike share mm. scheme is of great interest yeah. given that it's hilly, you know, mm. terrain. So, okay. Get up, see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th well, thank you all very much um, for your time this morning. That was a, a very good session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you all out on your bicycles <laughs> and on We're as well. next week. <laughs> Members, if we're moving then to our next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, there were a number of issues really that we raised during that um, session. If you're content, um, Alison and the staff yeah. maybe just review um, <laughs> the recording and pick up on some of that. Maybe just send an email out to, to members um, maybe tomorrow yeah. um, with some of the issues that we might want to raise and if there's anything additional. Okay. Thank you. Moving then to the next session, which is our departmental briefing on living with water in Belfast. At page 93 we have the departmental briefing paper. At page 122 we have the background briefing paper and again um, Hansard will record the meeting and we will welcome um, Simon Richardson, Director of Living with Water Programme and Stuart Whitman, the Programme Manager of Living with Water Programme. You're both very welcome um, to the committee this morning. It's good to see you both. Um, I understand that you'll you want to make a presentation and then members will follow up with some questions. Yes, Chair, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity for us to brief the committee today on the Living with Water Programme Strategic Drainage Infrastructure Plan, which is entitled uh, Living with Water in Belfast. As you will be aware, the Minister launched a public consultation on the plan last week, the 11th of November, and that consultation will uh, run to the 29th of January. We have a presentation which I think is in your, your pack. Um, I think it starts at page 93. Um, and we will refer to each page as we go along just for to aid, to aid us getting through. Um, Chair, there are 29 slides. We will move through them very quickly. Okay. Um, I know your time, we're all pushed for time. The reason I wanted to, this is the presentation we will use during the consultation process, and I felt it was very important to provide the full presentation to committee members today, if that's okay. No, that's, that's good. That's, that's, we'll move through it very quickly. So the first slide is on page 93. It's just an introductory slide, uh, introducing myself as programme director and Stuart here, my colleague, as the programme manager. Page 94, the plan itself is set out in four sections. Uh, for today's presentation, I will lead us through sections one and two, and Stuart will lead through sections three and four. So section one is setting the scene and moving on to page 95. A bit of background. Back in 2014, following a number of um, flooding events, the executive at that stage uh, approved the development of a strategic drainage infrastructure plan for Belfast. Uh, the aims were to protect against flooding, enhance the environment and grow the economy. And I will come back to those key aims through the presentation. 
and to take that forward, the Living with Water programme was established as a multi-agency programme led by the Department. Going forward, once we have the plan developed and approved, we will then develop uh, planning guidance to allow integrated drainage to be developed for other plans across Northern Ireland. So, Moving on to page 96, the, scale of, uh, the plan area that we are covering, the geographical area, uh, you will notice the six dots around uh, Belfast Lock. Those are the six wastewater treatment works that discharge into Belfast Lock. And the area was set as the catchments that actually feed into those wastewater uh, treatment works. The, the area is uh, divided into four study areas. We have three land-based study areas and, and Belfast Lock itself as a study area. Page 97 then takes us on to section 2, which is the case for change. And then if we look at pages 98 and 99, throughout the document we have used illustrations and graphics to, sh to show the Living With Water approach that it's catchment based and we're, you know, we're trying to manage water uh, through the catchment. Now, uh, page 98 uh, highlights some of the existing infrastructure. I'll not go through that. You can see that for yourself. And also on page 99, it looks at some of the problems and highlights some of the flooding problems. It then takes us on to, to page 100 and the first objective that we, that we want to try and deal with with the plan, and that's to protect uh, against flooding. And we want to do that by managing the flow of water through a catchment from source to sea. And we want to use integrated sustainable schemes uh, and try and utilise green spaces in urban areas. If you look to the map to the left, there are 12 areas of significant, a potential significant flood risk across Northern Ireland. Four of those areas are included within the plan area, so that shows the level of flooding risk that there is within the plan area. On to page 101, we have a few photographs there which, which show the, the flooding that's happened in the past. Bottom left is Lattice Drive in Belfast, and that's surface water flooding back in 2012. Top left was back in, in 2014 when we had a tidal surge and the harbour wall was within centimetres of being overtopped. And then the photograph to the right is out of sewer flooding, which is particularly nasty for, for individual homes. Moving on to page 102, um, the enhance is the next objective we have, and we're looking to enhance the environment through effective wastewater man management through the provision of uh, blue-green infrastructure to benefit local communities. What we want to do here is improve the water, water quality both within our rivers and in Belfast Lock. If you notice the, the, the diagram to the left in Belfast Lock, again we have the six wastewater treatment works and you will notice the shellfish waters in the protected areas. Water quality in Belfast Lock is a key driver for us uh, through this plan. On to page 103, uh, the photographs again showing the pollution. But bottom left is the Fourth River and that's fly tipping along the Fourth River. Top left is debris that we've, uh, NI Water have removed from their sewer system, uh, rubbish to the left, and fats, oils, and greases to the right. The photograph to the top right I just want to pause on, Chair. This is scaffolding over the Blackstaff River in Belfast, and that was to accommodate a concert, the stage of a concert in Boucher Road playing fields. You can see the, the debris on the, on the scaffolding. That's uh, sewage-related debris coming out of combined sewer overflows. So if you imagine that caught on the scaffolding, you'd imagine what didn't catch in the scaffolding and has now progressed down into Belfast Lock. That's the level of pollution that's finding its way to Belfast Lock. Moving on to uh, page 104, and the third key objective is facilitating economic growth. And we want to do that by providing the necessary capacity within our wastewater management systems so that we can, develop, we can facilitate new development and new house building. The diagram to the left, again, uh, shows the wastewater capacity in various areas across the plan area. The red is where any water systems are at capacity already, and they may be uh, replying with negative responses to new planning applications. The yellow areas are areas that are under review at the moment and could well turn red in the near future. And then the amber areas are areas where we do, they do have some constraints, and there, there's, there's the potential for negative responses. So moving on to page 105, and the living with water approach. Again, we're using the, the catchment illustration to show what we're trying to do. Again, I'm not going to run through all of those, but we're looking to do upper catchment management and try and slow the water down in the hills around Belfast. Then as we move down into the urban areas, we're looking to identify green spaces within urban areas where we can attenuate water and slow the flow of water through, uh, through the catchment. Then as we move further down into the, um, down towards the Loch Shore, we, we will be, uh, doing hard engineered infrastructure, improvements to sewers, improvements to wastewater treatment works, and tidal defences as well. 
Page 106 illustrates the need for catchment-based approach, and this is, this is the, the issue cycle. If you imagine point number one is where a developer wants to come and, and link into the foul or combined sewer network, and then I water have no capacity, and they say no. They need to get capacity in their sewers, so they want to put some stormwater into the rivers. And at point number three, DFI rivers are saying, no, the rivers are at capacity, and additional water will flood. So there's a vicious circle, which is really hard to break. If you go on to page number 107, we're trying to turn that circle around, whereby point number one, we're trying to build in capacity within the water courses, so attenuating water in green spaces. That then may allow NI Water to do some storm separation within their combined sewer systems, and that in turn then may allow uh, developers to come and link into the system. So it's really turning the, the, the problems and trying to solve those in an integrated way. Moving on to page 108. This is an example of what we're trying to do in, in the urban area. This is in Clenethley in Wales. The photograph to the top left is a swale, which is a, a constructed depression in a, in a green space just to the side of a housing development. During dry weather, there's no water in it, or very little. When it rains and the water runs off the road network and the, the housing development on the right-hand side, the swale fills up, and that slows the water down, and the water doesn't all go into the network at the same time. If you look at the hydrograph below, the red line is the, water, is the flow of water in the, net, in the sewer network if there was no swale there. The blue line at the bottom actually flattens out that peak and lets the water uh, flow into the, the, the sewer network in a slower rate. Also, some of the water in the, in the swale will infiltrate into the ground and will not make its way into the, the system, which is good, and also may evaporate. So that takes me on to page 109, which is section 3, and I'm going to pass over to Stuart then to uh, take us forward. Thanks, Simon. Um, section 3 <coughs> covers the plan outputs. Um, page 109. If I just turn to 110, the, the, the outputs are presented in the, in the plan in, in sort of three, cat three broad categories. There's uh, policy measures, catchment-based solutions, and upgrades to wastewater treatment works. And I'll cover each of these in turn. If we turn to page 111, there's sort of three categories of policy measure that we're, we're, we're trying to progress through the plan. The first, I'm sure you'll be familiar with, is sustainable drainage systems. And really, it's about progressing policy work to resolve the issues around the approval design, um, adoption, and maintenance of softer sustainable drainage systems. So that's that's your 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 rain gardens, your swales that Simon covered there. Um, you know, a permeable paving. There's been a, there's been a challenge there's, um, recently to, to you know, trying to get developers to consider those, and we've done some work, as you were a number of years back. With, I mean, the, what the 2006 order. But that, that there's hard suds have come along, but we've got to really, you know, to try to get the soft suds to come along as well as part of new development. Natural flood management is, is is similar to suds, but that's that's more about you know encouraging landowners to use their land um, for flood risk management purposes. That could be for storing water during a heavy rainfall event. So again, we're looking at developing guidance and policy to see if there's some way we can incentivise that. Particularly, our plan today is focused on on publicly owned land such as. Uh, council space and housing sector, etc. Whereas we also want to look at is there private land out there as well that we can use. The last point is really the rule of living of water going forward. We don't want this to be a one-off thing. We want this to become the business as usual approach. So there's, there's a need to put arrangements in place to make sure that this integrated approach continues. And Simon alluded to it earlier. We're hoping to do a, once the, once the Belfast plan is finalised, we're going to be looking at a, rolling out a guide that, that means similar plans can be developed for other areas. You know, such as such as dairy and such as Newry that, that are high up in terms of flood risk management as well. Um, just turning to page 112, the catchment base solutions. Simon covered the four study areas. This is one of the study areas shown on shown on the map. This is this is the Cons Water and Lagan Embankment study area. Um, for the purposes of assessment, it, it was actually split into five smaller sub catchments, um, really determined by where, where, where we found the issues and pressures and, and, and where the local uh, rivers and water courses were. For each of the study areas, there was a, a technical working group established, which, which included representatives from the drainage organisations, um, from the councils, and from the uh, regulators as well. And they, they assessed each, each of these subcatchments in turn. If you turn to page 113, that's actually the Hollywood subcatchment within, uh, within the larger uh, Conswater Lagan Embankment. And this, this has shown the issues and pressures that we identified. And what I mean by issues and pressures is it could be flooding fl pressures that we're aware of, flooding hotspots. It could be development constraints that we're aware of, or it could be um, water quality issues in the rivers caused by caused by pollution. You've seen the, obviously the photograph of the Blackstaff um, River. Uh, turning to page 114, we then took those those issues and pressures 
and examined the catchment to see what opportunities existed. And there's sort of two types of opportunity. There's opportunities in terms of, is there, is there green spaces close by to where those problems are occurring that we can possibly utilise to store water? Or are there existing schemes being done by government, capital schemes that we could piggyback on, for example, and extend the remit of to, to include some, some drainage works? So after we've done that approach, we came up with a series of sort of concepts. And I will go through these in detail. These are in the plan. But for each of the subcatchments, the, these concepts were then put together. And if you turn to page 115, that's sort of zooming back out. And that's showing you the whole of the Conswater and, and Lagan Embankment study area. And as you can see, there's a, there's a multitude of these concepts that were, were developed. These, now, these have to go through detailed appraisal and design before they become shovel-ready projects. And of course, they're subject to funding availability. But it's really the starting point of us saying, look, there's another way of doing this. There's another way of, of, of manage, managing uh, rainwater and uh, you know, through the catchment. If we turn to page 116 in your packs, um, I won't, I won't uh, dwell on this too. The, this is the, the third key area, which is the wastewater treatment works. It doesn't matter how much blue-green infrastructure we do in the catchments. There's a sewage load produced from, from households and businesses that has to, be, has to be collected and pumped and treated. And really, the treatment works have there's three major upgrades that are needed. There's capacity increases to cover both current and future uh, sewage loads for growth. There's um, enhanced levels of treatment that will be needed to meet current standards to, to help improve the quality of the water in the lock and, and the rivers. And thirdly, so there, four of the treatment works have to have the outfall pipes extended, which is quite a major piece of work. Again, this is to do with the, the water quality and, 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 the, and the environmental standards. Um, so that's set out in, in detail in, in the plan as well. And it's no surprise we'll come to later. The, the wastewater treatment works make up the lion's share of the investment in this. Um, turn to page 117. Um, this is moving to the, the, the last section, which is the delivery framework. The, the plan is a 12-year programme, starting from April next year, April 2021, running through to March 2033. And uh, it's, it's a long-term programme, but it's major, the reason it's, it, it has to be done on such a long-term pro programme is because there's a critical path that has to be followed. There are certain things, like the catchments, have to be done in advance of the treatment works, etc. Um, and also just the sheer scale of the investment, it just would, it would, just would not be practical to be able to, to deliver it sooner. Um, if you turn to page 118, the blue-green elements are new to us. It's a new area that we're, you know, in terms of the storage and, and what have you. So um, there's a lot of modelling work that's required to take those concepts that I mentioned earlier through the actual uh, projects on the ground. So in the interim, we've identified a number of pilot projects that we want to work through to sort of learn how, how, you, know, how, how you progress these new techniques. Um, the first one is Bally and Plains Feeds. That's next year, and it's actually there's a there's a, a three million pound project, urban villages project, being brought forward by the executive office with Belfast City Council to upgrade the the playing fields, including 3G pitches and the like. We're hoping to piggyback on that, piggyback on that scheme, and contribute um, a, a investment next year to do works to the water courses that pass through the park. Some of the rivers are actually are actually piped, so we're hoping to daylight those rivers and basically bring them back. And, and, and you know, not, not only will you have provide opportunity for the river to spill out and 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 and, and flood, you know, ha, you know, restore its floodplain, you also provide an amenity and biodiversity benefit as well. Um, that's a major project. The, the the other three are slightly smaller. Fourth River attenuation. We're looking to work with the the, the piece four proposals, which the council I think um, was in the news, the headlines a number of weeks back. We're hoping to, to piggyback with their with their works to, to do a greenway. Um, to also do some works to the river alongside that. That could include addressing some of the combined sewer overflows, along with doing some things like leaky dams, where you, you, you allow water to continue. During normal conditions, the water flows down the river as normal, but whenever you get rainfall, it begins to back up. And it's all about slowing this peak flow of water down, you know, down the catchment during heavy rainfall. It's a bit like managing traffic during a rush hour. I, try to, I always use the analogy, you're trying to slow it down and dump it down. Um, Belfast Castle is a very small project, but it's, it's, it's about looking at an opportunity to, to, within the grounds of Belfast Castle to, to, do, to build a swale, to build a leaky dam, nearly as an education side of things. You know, what do these things look like? And it would be an opportunity to, it would be a, to bring schools out and, and actually see what these, what these things are, what these features are. And then um, in Derry, as part of Living With Water, um, our minister... Has, has earmarked um, £130,000 this year to actually, um, as part of the A2 and Cranor Road Scheme in Derry, um, we've extended the scope of that to actually to work with our roads colleagues to actually look at um, a study to see if we can, what, if living with water approach can be 
can, can be ruled out in Derry, and that's, a, that's only just been, that's been commissioned as we speak. Um, turning to page 119, financing and delivery. Um, it's a huge plan, as I said. It's est- currently estimated that it will be around £1.4 billion over the next 12 years. The pie chart there shows the, the split up, as you can see. Um, around £1.2 billion of that is made up of wastewater treatment works and sewage networks. However, there is a significant amount of £200 million that we've earmarked for blue-green infrastructure. We would hope that by doing the blue-green infrastructure, the scale of some of, some of the sewage networks could, could possibly be reduced, and certainly the whole life costs of some of the, some of the works would be reduced. Just to finish, turn to page um, 120. This just shows you the, the initial profile. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of modelling work in the early years still needs to be done, so we're not really getting up to full delivery until the sort of halfway through year three and into year four. Um, obviously, this is an indicative profile. A lot, all of this will be dependent on um, the, obviously the, I think you're being briefed next week by my colleagues in the department about the draft determination and what have you. Um, it'll all be dependent on, on, on budget availability. And just to turn to page 121. Uh, I said uh, thank you for for listening. And one of the things, the consultation period is to run to the 29th of January. So we'll be more than happy to come back and later and give you feedback of the responses as well. I know that would be really Thanks. helpful. Sure, that was a very quick run through, uh, quite a detailed that. presentation. But I think it was important to show you all the slides and, and may prompt some questions. So. No, absolutely, and that was really useful. And obviously, we're, we're well aware of the problem um, that's been highlighted over a significant big number number of years. Um, and obviously, you've carried out quite a detailed um, piece of work in order to get to this stage. And, and obviously, looking at alternatives. And obviously, as I suppose time has gone on, um, there's been sort of more innovative methods as well that can be, be used in addressing some of these issues. Um, just in relation to the consultation itself. Um, who is this primarily being targeted at and what do you hope to get back? Because if you're looking to start this project, obviously, um, next year, and this doesn't conclude until the end of January, and there's obviously timing um, issues there too. You know, I'm just sort of, I know we have to go through a consultation process, but I'm just w- wanting yeah. to find out really what the purpose of, of the timing of it is now. And should this have been done at an earlier stage? Yeah. The, the, the consultation process, and we, we have a Living with Water programme board, and we have a lot of key stakeholders, all the drainage organisations are in that board, and a lot of work has been done, um, and we have identified some projects that will come forward in the early part of the, of the process. The consultation process is raising awareness about what Living with Water is. I think there's a bit of an identity issue, you know, really, what is it, and what are we trying to do, and I think that is, is one of the key issues. There are other big organisations and landowners who aren't on the board, who that we've now brought in recently, uh, the likes of the National Trust, Northern Ireland Housing Executive, who are very keen to get involved with us to see how they can help not only us, but help themselves to manage their land and, and how best we can use that. So there is, I think the key element of the consultation is raising awareness of what living with water is, trying to tie up with landowners who are doing capital projects to see if we can, if we can do mutually beneficial work, uh, and then trying to instill Stuart talked about the road scheme and the A2 Bunkrana Road. That scheme was actually brought to us by our colleagues in, in roads. Um, and I think as we build awareness, people will come to us in relation to there might be a living with water element to this that is beneficial to everyone. And I think that is going to be the key, the key part of what we do. The consultation process, this is a we're bidding for £1.2 billion worth of money. If we'd done the consultation process earlier, we wouldn't have had the level of information that we now have. And I think from, a, from an information point of view, we need that level of detail to go out to consultation. So when people challenge us about why we've identi- identified a potential option, mm-hmm. we need to fall back and say, this, the, this is our initial analysis of where we are. So I think we have that level of detail, and we now are able to engage constructively with, with landowners to, to, to bring forward other opportunities. OK, and, and obviously this is sort of a... a an overarching consultation as opposed to there'll be further consultations with regards to specific areas too so um, anyone who misses this obviously will have a further opportunity to engage Um, obviously we're in a pandemic and the timing of this probably isn't helpful either you're moving into Christmas period and all of those things I suppose it is obviously difficult to get the right time Um, how are you going to carry out your consultation well we've We've uh, sent all our uh, the consultation document to all the relevant stakeholders and uh, tried to do as widespread as possible. Um, we have 
uh, meetings scheduled with all the councils that are involved, um, all of the key landowners that are talked about, and anyone that approaches us for for uh, an information briefing on this, we will provide that. So it really is it's really getting the information out there. And again, back to your point, you know, is it the right time to go? And it's a difficult time. I think that, I don't think there's any benefit in leaving it any longer. I think, as you say, we had to get it out there. And we will take every opportunity that we can. Stuart and I have a number of briefings like this set in the diary from now to Christmas. And I think that will be very useful to allow those uh, stakeholders then to, to uh, provide us with their responses by the end of January. And it really is a, a sort of stimulator to conversation, really, isn't it, too? And exactly. if, any, if anyone else has further ideas or concepts that they can bring to you. And we have found out, particularly with the councils that are involved, that the area takes in part of five council areas. And councils, in the discussions we've had, have brought forward schemes which they feel maybe have potential to fall into this living with water assessment. And we will certainly look at that. And I think that's another part of the consultation. If there's anything we missed... You know, we'll happily take that, take those things on board. That's that's definitely a big thing. The list of concepts are not exhaustive. Some of those concepts, as we move through the process, will drop out. More will be added in. And one of the challenges was Belfast City Council sit on the board, and we've had a lot of engagement with them. We're conscious that with the other councils, because of the pandemic, it's been quite challenging. Mm -hmm. So the the consultation will be an opportunity to hopefully. To, and as Simon said, we're doing a round of sort of yeah. engagement with all the councils. Yeah, I don't think any of us should underestimate that it's a massive piece of work. Huge mm -hmm. undertaking for the department. Um, Liz Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Simon and Stuart there for giving us um, such a comprehensive um, presentation. I suppose um, I'm, I'm delighted to hear Nuri mentioned uh, as part of that because I was a wee bit concerned that it was it was focusing mainly on Belfast. But um, I know I've raised it before with Simon and, and others that um, Nuri, I suppose, is one of the should be a high priority in terms of um, the flood risks there. Just on that, because obviously we've had NI Water in as well, talking about PC21 um, and and their uh, plans around that. Um, can you just kind of detail then the difference between the two and, and if um, funding will be taken from the NI Water's budget or is, is, is the Living With Water uh, programme going to be funded completely separately? Okay. Um, in, in relation to funding, obviously the uh, utility regulators draft determinations out at the moment for PC21, um, and I think there's a presentation next week. Um, but the, the, I mean the, all of that funding will come um, from central government. In a way, that's how NI Water are funded at the moment, um, and the, the draft determination from the utility regulator will set the level that they feel that the business plan for the work that NI Water should do. Um, as the pie chart that Stuart had shown, there's £200 million allocated over the next 12 years. For, not allocated. Um, we've identified that could be spent on blue-green over the next 12 years. Again, that will have to be found from the department's budget as well. Um, so it, it's not a case of taking money off NI Water to do this work. It's a case of, it's a case of allocating uh, the, the, the money that is required for the different elements of the Living with Water. So, as Stuart said, the, the work to the wastewater treatment works. There's really nothing we can do to influence that with blue-green infrastructure. We can influence the work that has to be done on the networks by doing blue-green infrastructure. Uh, as I said, the sewers, and we, just to avoid building bigger sewers, we try and do blue-green infrastructure. So we do have some, possibly some influence going forward to try and reduce that. But the level of funding that NI Water have, have identified within their PC21 business plan um, obviously will we'll follow through the PC21 process and the, that determination. But it's not necessarily taking money off NA Water to deliver this. It's, 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 a, it's a wider concept than that. Yeah, no, no, that's fair enough. And I, I suppose maybe I didn't want to come across it as in um, they'll be disadvantaged or anything like that. I suppose because both are looking at the same elements of, of um, wastewater, um, it's just to kind of try and from my own mind differentiate and, and see... Um, how they were working, I suppose, are they working almost in conjunction or, you know, um, to, you know, one will help the other, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of the blue-green infrastructure, I was very interested by that because I suppose, obviously, we've just had an, a presentation from Scots Trans there and um, the department officials around active travel. And, you know, we did within that talk about the blue-green infrastructure fund um, in terms of 
travel. So I was interested to see how that links in with um with what the Living with Water program is proposing. And I mean, I know uh, Stuart gave a few examples there, but just to get a wee bit more information on that and, and how that does tie in, how you're able to get funding from from that fund. Well, um, in relation to blue green, and obviously the, the minister has a, a a fund this year, which which you've had a presentation on previously. Um, uh, for example, Stuart mentioned the Fourth River in Belfast, the, the Peace Four project, the Greenway project there, and what we're trying to do there is link link into the, the work that's being done on the Greenway to try and do some water quality improvements and some uh, water attenuation work on the river, which will run alongside the Greenway. So I think the two complement each other. You know, you can have a greenway there, but if you have a filthy river, it's not very pleasant to to, to, to walk or cycle along. Um, whereas if we can do the work that we want to do on the blue side, of, the blue element of it, we can hold the water back um, when it's wet, uh, and obviously the, improve the water quality. So there's there's a flooding benefit. There's a, a environmental water quality benefit, and also there's a, a amenity benefit and how it looks. So it's really as I said before, it's trying to identify capital schemes that councils or any other body are providing for, for, that we could tie up with. Um, and I think, you know, getting back to your question about the, t the link between NI water and living with water, and it's, it is a subtle one, you know, and, and that's something we're trying to do over the next consultation period to show that what living with water is. I mean, NI water are a, a drainage organisation, as are DFI rivers, as are DFI roads. And they will have to deal with their individual problems as they see it or issues that they have. Living with Water is trying to bring those organisations together to bring forward strategic solutions that may provide other opportunities that the, the, each organisation on their own wouldn't be able to bring forward. And that's, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue for us going forward in this consultation process, and it's a very valid point you've made, and, and we will have to try and uh, differentiate between that and, and explain that going forward. For yeah, very helpful, yeah. Sorry, it's, um, it's worth maybe just saying that I think it's around about a quarter of, of I think the draft determinations two billion pounds for water and sewage services is what um, over the next over the next six years, starting from from April, and it's around a quarter of that is sort of allocated to the wastewater in Belfast, just to give you a sense. Whereas the rest of it would be for for drinking water across the the, the, the whole of the north, and then wastewater. Um, outside Belfast, so it's about around a quarter. Is is, is if it's not ring fence, but it's sort of you know it's, it's allocated living with water within the draft determination. Okay, no, that's fair. Well, that makes perfect sense, and I have a good understanding now for what you're coming from. My last question is just around um, where we talk about um, helping private land landowners to utilise uh, their land for for natural flood management. And I know um, you mentioned the likes of housing executive and some of the statutory bodies. In terms of private ownership, you know, um, is there any incentives or, or grants or anything like that that will be made available to private landowners to try and encourage them to um, to work with you on that? That's that's one of the policy proposals that um, the department um, needs to needs to, needs to, needs to consider. Um, I highlighted earlier that to date with the plan, our focus has very much been on the publicly owned land, um, and. I'm not saying it's low-hanging fruit. It's certainly not easy to do. We've got a lot of work to do to even use those those public spaces. But um, there's no doubt that there will be as you the, the further you move out the catchment, the, the more chance you are to move into private land, um, particularly in the rural areas. So, yes, that's an area that we need to, that, 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 that we've identified for a priority. Um, and you know, natural flood management. It's called. It doesn't always have to be. In, it can also be in the urban area. You know, so anybody, if there's a big private green space, for example. But at the minute, we don't have that mechanism, but that's something we, we, we're going, we need to look at. Okay, no, that's fair enough. Thank you both. Thanks, Chair. That's me. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you both for, for the presentation. I, I found it quite interesting, and it uh, touches on a lot of work that, that I'm particularly involved in in Derry as an MLA. And given the natural based catchment management uh, scheme that you talked about, I know that you would be acutely aware in the first instance that wastewater sewage capacity is a problem across the north. It's certainly a problem in my own constituency. I'm sure it's a problem for, for many other MLAs uh, that will probably address you here today. 
My difficulty is that the Living with Water programme focusing only on Belfast when, for instance, in Derry, there have been housing developments stopped because there is equally uh, insufficient wastewater system uh, capacity in Derry too. So with that, uh, taking that into account, um, the new decade, new approach, uh, what kind of engagements have you had, for instance, with the British government and Irish government who are contributors to this new decade, new approach as well, in relation to the funding that you're looking for? Because in the answer that you give uh, to my colleague um, around the NA water budget, uh, I'm just conscious of perhaps where the funding from that budget will concentrate on an area which needs it. I, I accept that Belfast is in capacity. But I also want it equally accepted that so are areas like Derry. Just well, on the, the PC21 business plan that, that any water have at the moment, um, yes, there's a proportion allocated to living with water, mm -hmm. which is the, the programme that we're doing, and it's, it's based along the geographical plan that we showed. In addition to that, there is uh, funding, that, sorry, there is a bid for. Um, uh, Wastewater treatment works outside of Belfast, so it's not there, there's, it's not all of the wastewater treatment uh, money is not just allocated to living with water in Belfast. There is a proportion of it allocated to areas outside Belfast, and that's included in their PC21 business plan. So it's not a Belfast and nothing. It's it's the Belfast approach is being being looked at under living with water. Uh, the rest of Northern Ireland at the moment isn't, but I would like to extend that out, and that's why I'm very keen to grasp the, the, the project in Derry, which Rhodes brought to our attention, because it ticks all the boxes for living with water, and it allows us to look at opportunities right through the catchment uh, along the uh, the uh, Bunkrana Road. But we're very keen now to extend that out to a city-wide uh, living with water type approach. So. Again, we would said that we, after we had done the Belfast plan, we were going to do a, a design guidance for integrated drainage. We we'll probably moved ahead of ourselves to, to, to bring in the, 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 this, the dairy scheme as well, and I am really pleased about that. Um, so I think from a living with water, that, that aspect and the discussions we are going to have in dairy very soon as well will raise awareness there and raise awareness of what we are trying to do. I met with uh, Chair through Chair, met with DFI Roads last week, uh, and we spoke uh, directly about the A2 Bunkrana Road yes. and the study that was taking place there and just to look at the examination of the, the potential for, for the integrated drainage uh, as you have outlined within the Skag River and the, the Pennyburn River catchment area as well. And it's with that in mind uh, that because I was listening to your response to the Chair around the consultation process uh, that is taking place in its totality and obviously you mentioned the partners and you mentioned council and there's different owners of pieces of land in the linear park for instance mm -hmm. in Derry where where this uh, with this hopefully yeah. uh, will be sure. will, will assist with getting a natural base catchment management in consultation with the community in Skeg. Mm -hmm. nothing about them without them so I would like to ensure that the people in that area is consulted. There's a fantastic organisation, as there are in other places of Derry, GSAP, the Greater Chantala Area Partnership, that pulls in all of the different organisations. So I would ask that when you are undergoing your, your engagements with people, that you have GSAP and the partnership and the people of that area involved in the consultation. Mm -hmm. I have been made aware of the ex through through my Rhodes colleagues of the excellent engagement that there has been in that area, and um, as I say, it really without going over it again, Chair, it really does tick all the living with water mm -hmm. boxes and the approach, yeah. and that's why I'm very keen to grasp this opportunity because it's exactly it's exactly what we want. We want other organisations coming to us and say there's an opportunity here. Let's discuss it. Yeah, and the Gallia uh, residents mm -hmm. yes, need to be involved in yeah. that consultation. Thank you, yeah. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much. Uh, be relatively brief. There's significant financial investment required to, to be able to deliver this. Uh, what's the implications if you don't get that? Well, um, if you're speaking to NA Water, obviously, the, yeah. I mean, the, the, we've, we've highlighted the the, um, the the three the three key objectives. I mean, protect. I mean, there's there's likely to be increased flooding. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, the water quality in Belfast Lock, as I said to you before, is, is one of the key drivers within what we're trying to do here. And the, the shellfish uh, uh, waters there is a very important um, business, which obviously is dependent on the water quality. Um, and then, obviously, the, the big one, the, 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 the capacity for growth and the capacity for new planning applications. Um, the, you know, if you go back to the old methods, you know, you could fund NI Water to do what they've done before, which is build bigger wastewater treatment works and big, build bigger sewers. But is that the right way to go? Um, so th there's no doubt that there's investment required to bring the wastewater uh, system up to the requirement. What we're trying to do is look at holistic solutions that will bring more sustainable, integrated approach. But I think, um, obviously, if you're speaking to NI Water, they would tell you exactly what their the implications for them are likely to be if, if, if the wastewater systems aren't funded going forward. Again, the Living With Water is trying to pull together all of the organisations to look at capacity with on all the systems, because the capacity in the rivers could have a big influence on what NI Water do in a certain area, rather than build bigger pipes. Yeah. It, may, it may storm separate to get into the rivers, but if there's no capacity in the river, you can't do that. So it's, it's trying to, Living With Water is about trying to to give everybody a bigger picture of, of what, what is um, um, bigger opportunities to, to, to come forward with more integrated solutions. It's worth saying as well that it's a 12-year plan. One of the big challenges is not just about getting the money, it's about how you get the money. And the, the idea of being in one-year budgets is very challenging to, to plan for the longer term. So hopefully by having a longer term approach, you know, at least you can you, you, you can't deliver an integrated solution unless you have that longer term approach, because then you react to when you get the money, and you tend to do the easier solutions when you react. So, well, next year is going to be a one-year budget, and as a result of decision yeah. by Treasury, also mm -hmm. the Chancellor has made it clear they want to balance the books in the medium term, which obviously brings concerns around the bringing back austerity in terms of the old policy of the UK government. Um, and the issue for me is that if we do, this money isn't forthcoming, there's beaches in Helens Bay and Crawfordsburn and Ballyhome in my own constituency. People go swimming in those beaches on a, a daily basis, or at least them. Especially in the current weather, is there an implication then that it would be saying that the bathing water quality is not of sufficient standard if the money isn't invested in this? Well, that that would be for the individual organisations to look at. Again, what we're trying to do with this, we're trying to, um, if the money is available and the money is forthcoming, how is it best spent, and how do, what delivers the best overall solution for Northern Ireland PLC? Um, so. There, there, Underfunding or lack of funding going forward will have serious implications. There's no doubt about that. Um, but again, what we're trying to do within this program is show what we can do with the money and show what the outcomes will be if we do this. Uh, and that, I mean, if we come bidding for 1.2 uh, billion pounds worth of, of money, or 1.4 billion, and didn't have the plan behind us, we wouldn't expect to get the money. We actually, the detailed work that we have done behind this plan, I hope, will help us make the case for the level of investment that is required across the different organisations, and but to be delivered on an integrated approach that we are suggesting here. So I'm hoping that that plan helps everyone identify if if, if the funding is needed and if it's how it's, how it's best spent. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, Mr. Beggs, just a brief one. Um, it mentioned there can be a choice of uh, building bigger uh, sewage treatment works or looking at other flows or other influences. So is there a clear business case where money uh, would be better spent um, um, upstream rather than purely at the sewage infrastructure or the, or the treatment works? I think, I think there's different scenarios. You know, it depends what the, what the issue is. If, if it's a Hydraulic issue at the wastewater treatment. I mean, by there's too much water getting. You know, if, at the combined sewer system. Um, you know, if, if clean water is getting into the combined sewer system, once it gets in there, it has to be pumped a number of times to the wastewater treatment works and then be treated. Now that's clean water. If we can separate that clean water out and don't let it get into the the system, then there's less pumping costs for the NI water and there's less treatment costs at the at, at the wastewater treatment works. So we we can influence. Hydraulic loading, i.e. the flow. As Stuart said, no matter how much we do with, with the hydraulic load, there's still a biological load that will get to the plant. And in, in reality, actually, if we're successful in taking out the clean water and there are lesser combined sewer overflows, that example that I showed for the, for the scaffolding 
you know, there's the pollution that's getting into the water course at the moment. We don't want it to get into the water course at the moment. So if it stays in the sewers, there's more sewage getting to the wastewater treatment works. So if you look at it from a biological load point of view, if we're successful, you probably need more treatment at the wastewater treatment work. But you're treating the stuff you're meant to be treating. You're not treating clean water, which shouldn't be in there. So it's, it, it depends what the problem is at the wastewater treatment works. Is it a hydraulic issue, i.e. too much water getting there, clean water, which well, was not clean when it gets there, but it, we could have separated it at a certain point, or whether it's the biological load part of it that needs to be treated. And, and there, there, there will be different scenarios for each one. So. And then just finally, uh, in terms of it, up, upstream, um, I suppose, ponding to avoid uh, yeah. peak flows, how do you convince landowners to sacrifice uh, parts of the ground, particularly if it's small farmers that might be involved. So, how, how do you convince them to sacrifice part of their land for the benefit of the urban area down below? There's that, as I alluded to earlier. There's a that's a policy a policy work that has to be taken forward to look at that, and it's likely to require incentivisation in some shape or form. Um, whether that would be some sort of grant scheme or what, that would have to be determined through through, through the policy. Um, but from a from a, you mentioned the business case in your first question. From a, one of the one of the work streams within the plan is that traditionally each of the drainage organisations would have looked at their own infrastructure and their business cases would have been focused on their own infrastructure. One of the, one of the things we're looking at is well, if we do a joint business case and you take the benefits for rivers, the benefits for road, for Northern Ireland water, and the benefits because you're for biodiversity and enhanced amenity, you suddenly have a much larger set of benefits. So, um, from a from a public expenditure point of view. You have a clear, you have a clear, a clear case. But in terms of individual landowners, we there's a there's a policy stream that we've identified that needs to be worked through. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you for the presentation um, this afternoon. Um, looks like we're going to be seeing you again in order yes, just sir. to develop this further. So, um, but thank you for for the the work involved in all of that actually, and um, it's actually good to see solutions. Yep. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you very, much. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members are content. I think we leave this at this stage and just return to it again. Yeah. Okay. Moving then to our forward work program. Just draw your attention to that. Um, this is our schedule of work until um, the Christmas recess, and that's at page 124. If you're content with that. Yeah. Um, any other business? I don't have anything to raise at this stage. Anyone else? No. Thank you. Just advise you all then to just maintain social distancing um, as you're leaving the meeting and remove all your own um, papers, water bottles, etc. Uh, the date and time of the next meeting is next Wednesday, the 25th of November at 10am in the Senate Chamber. The meeting is now adjourned. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.